<laughs> we'll let the rowdy crowd kind of settle in here before we start. Sure. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting to order on Tuesday, January 28th. Um, the first order of business would be just to call us to order. So I know we have a full committee tonight, so we can then move on. Um, in approval of minutes from last time. That's going to be a tough one because I guess, I guess I'm the <laughs> last but person. You're allowed state. to approve even if you weren't at the meeting. You just have to agree that what's on there is accurate. Yes. So is there she a, explained to that. So moved. A, yeah, you're good with them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. So just a second. And then yeah, a any, second. Any discussion? <laughs> okay. We're, we're going to defer to you. <laughs> All those in favor. Good. Okay, great. Um, and then the next item on the agenda is to review the financial statements. But before we do that, I'll just take a little detour. And I know we had some questions today, Tom. Mm -hmm. and can you maybe just give us, or Larissa, I know you responded too. Just kind of an update on the status of the audited financial statements. Yeah, we expect the audit will be in house printed uh, in house by the end of the week, so it's okay. it's here, so to speak. Uh, we do have all the relevant sections, <coughs> kind of the meat of it. Um, Ruth and her team does a, a terrific job. Some might say too thorough, but the whole management discussion part is in the front end of the document. That ends up taking an exceeding amount of time, um, but I think it's it's a really important piece, uh, frankly. So uh, my next step is to schedule uh, with uh, the town council chair and school board chair for a joint presentation. So uh, we weren't prepared to go into details. I, I do have a couple of the key exhibits available that I can hand to the finance committee tonight, and we can talk about uh, the balance sheet as well if you, if you want to go down that road. But um, I really think it's important to, to make sure we, we don't bypass the step of doing the joint presentation. Oh, well. no, absolutely. But I mean, this is just to kind of set historically. This isn't. This is about the usual time. Are we a little bit? It is. Later this I year? say that sheepishly, in spite of our best efforts yeah. and doubling down every time to get it out the door. Uh, we we do find ourselves in mid to late January, so it's very typical to have the presentation in February, which the charter calls for. Uh, I think most importantly, having it in your hands and to understand the financial position of the town before you start the budget is really, in my mind, the key part and we're always kind of very comfortably uh, in that time frame. I would note that I expect this council will be talking about a charter review this year, yep. and we may want to bring that up, uh, maybe shift some of those dates slightly. Uh, this isn't about keeping things away from the councilor for the, from the public, it's about recognizing the practical realities of, of getting the work accomplished. Yeah, so, so maybe I would suggest, so I, uh, I guess the only question I'd ask, you know, is, we have a pretty full agenda tonight. I'm assuming there's probably no not surprises in the numbers from what you have projected and we've seen previously. Um, no, I, I can tell you there's no no findings, which uh, second year in a row. That's great. It's, uh, last year was my first year in my professional career where there were no other findings, and this is certainly uh, another record to have two years in a row, so uh, a credit to the staff in, in finance. Uh, the other thing is uh, we did contribute positively to fund balance, and we can talk about that. That's an area that's of great interest, so uh, no surprises. Now, Tom, I wonder it? if we're talking apples and oranges, though. So when I, <clears throat> when I read the charter and what it calls for in terms of an audit is like what we have listed on our website. It's an actual report from Mc, mm -hmm. McPage mm -hmm. um, that, you know, explains, it's really full of disclaimers, like, you know, we didn't test for this, we didn't test for that, but um, we didn't find any deficiencies or significant deficiencies. It's kind of straightforward, but it doesn't have any financial numbers. It's just a summary of their process for auditing the financial results. It sounds like you're talking about something different. Is that the, are you talking about actually, actually releasing the annual statement? The actual CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, yeah. Okay. And that's so, on the finance website, you know, once it's done, there's, I think, uh, multiple years out there. So this, and after it's presented, the 2019 will go there. Correct. Sure. When I read the charter, I don't, I don't read it as referred to that. I read it just, it sounds like you already have the auditor's report because no, you know there's no deficiencies. It. Well, they've kind of given us the a heads up Thank you. On okay. Yeah. 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 So it's they're still writing. Collated and printed, essentially. It's so. in the printing phase, yeah. pretty much right now. So. And then I think you commented on this earlier as well. If there's no deficiencies, the second piece of what the charter calls for is a presentation on any remedies that the right. town manager and the superintendent will find. It. It doesn't sound like it's going to. That'll be necessary. Those remedies have focused on uh, noted comments from the auditors. You know, 
uh, suggestions for improvement of our practices, if you will. Um, so we, because there are no findings, uh, we don't expect we'll have any formal presentation in response. So the presentation you're talking about isn't something that's required by the charter. It's just something that you're going to do as part of the release for the official. Regardless, the these are the, our okay. our independent auditors. They don't work with staff yep. or for us. They work for you and for the taxpayers. Yeah. And so it's important for them to present without influence or involvement from council or from staff. We, we like to help supplement what they do, if you will, if you're willing to listen to us. But it's important that they give you their independent op opinion of our financial position. Okay. And what they're going to say is that the financial statements are the towns. They're not their financial statements. All they do is audit what we give them. They do do pieces of it, like the entity-wide stuff, and there's a whole big section in the back on, um, in the footnotes on main PERS and some GASB requirements for OPEP and that stuff that they get from actuarials from main PERS, so they pretty much do all of that piece of it, so. Okay. Yeah, and I guess I'd share that. I mean, the process has been that seems to work for all of us as elected officials, and it's the full council, it's the full school board, board of education. It's a pretty lengthy report, and mm -hmm. they go through it in pretty great detail explaining the numbers, explaining what they've done. They also open it up for questions for anybody that has it. So it's, it's usually a, a pretty thorough and comprehensive sort of review. It's usually about yeah. an hour. Yeah, it's a hour. standalone meeting. It's, it's important okay. to really preserve the time to, to have the thorough discussion and, and for you to hear from your independent auditor, not from us. There are five sections to the, to the CAFR that we put out and it's the first one is like the letter of transmittal talks about the town a little bit, where we've been, where we're going. Uh, the second piece is the uh, auditor's report. And then the third one is the management's discussion and analysis. Kind of gives a little bit of detail and graphs and stuff of what's going on in the town. Then there are the basic financial statements, that, which is what they technically audit. But they do take a look at the rest of them. There's a bunch of exhibits in the back. And then there's the statistical section. And then there's foot, and footnotes are in there also. So those are the, the different pieces of the, the annual audit. Cool. So, so two suggestions, maybe, Tom, as, mm -hmm. as quickly as we can. I know we have a full workshop schedule yeah, okay. coming up, but as soon as we can, it probably Yeah, we, we tried to do it on the 12th, knowing that the bodies are already together. Yeah. Unfortunately, our auditor is not available. He is available on the 19th. I just need to see if that's a date that works for okay. others. So to, to be announced, but uh, we'll look to get it done in February for sure. And I don't know if there's any preliminary. You said you had some preliminary numbers. And you we'll put any of those yeah, just temporarily out there on the. Do you want to jump into that uh, first? <coughs> so I'm giving those four pages. Yeah, I would call call that um, tentative, preliminary, draft, unaudited, draft. whatever you want to call it, until it comes so, out in the final document. Okay. And would you guys be comfortable putting this just out there after time? <coughs> um, I'd, I'd like to do it in the context of everything, so by the end of the week, we'll have it up. Yeah, um, okay, but sure, we're yeah. sharing it. Okay. Uh, we're comfortable and yep. confident in these uh, numbers to share these. So what, <clears throat> what we provide essentially is Exhibit um, A1. <clears throat> and from our perspective, and I think the auditors <clears throat> would agree, it really is the essence of the, the this is where everything's rolled yeah. up, if you will. <clears throat> so Ruth, do you want to give us a, a quick overview of these four pages? Sure. The first page, Exhibit A1, Excuse is me. the balance sheet of just the general fund, which includes the school department, the adult ed program, and the town general fund. And it goes, you know, balance sheets comprised of your assets, your liabilities, and fund balance. Uh, GASB or how also has deferred inflows of resources and outflows of resources, which you'll see on the financial statements in Statement 1. Uh, that we have both of those now because of the new OPEB and uh, retirement requirements. So um, it just kind of does a comparison between last year and this year. Our fund balance policy talks about uh, we're supposed to have 10% of last year's operating yep. and um, based on our unassigned we're at 8.2. I think we need to be at 8.8 .8 million so we're just a little bit shy. I might have those numbers wrong because I didn't think it was that much, but. Um. And this, so this means roughly the, the contribution of the unassigned balance went up about 400 last year? Uh, unassigned actually went up about oh. 824,000. Yeah. And overall oh, is about 540,000. Yeah. Yeah. 
built into the restricted numbers are uh, any deficits, well, the, um, that are in other funds, which is like the Heights Parkway on the sewer assessments that are due. And um, the education is not something that we can, we as the town can spend because it's hmm. specifically for education, so that also becomes restricted. Assigned is items like purchase orders that we've encumbered from last year into FY20. The assigned school is money they budgeted in fiscal 20 from their fund balance from last year. So again, that's not money we can technically use. Okay. And then exhibit A1, <coughs> exhibit A2 is uh, our revenues versus actual. And as we can see from last year to this year, 2018 is the final column. Last year we received about 80 million. This year we're at 86.6 million, so we've uh, increased our revenues over last year. Our revenues are higher than what we actually estimated last year as well. So, so if you look at that variance uh, column, second uh, to, uh, on the right-hand side, second one in. Yeah. Um, Couple things I would point out. Obviously, the anything in parentheses is we're uh, under revenues. Um, excise tax continues to perform um, in spite of our pushing that estimate up again. <laughs> Yet again, uh, we we actually uh, produce a sizable surplus in that regard. Eight hundred or four hundred and eighty-six thousand more than budget. Um, Working down that column, education state subsidies, uh, that's down slightly from what we expected. I can't really explain right now why that's so. I can ask Kate. Uh, but at the bottom, uh, you can see that uh, when you consider everything, all the different revenue lines were actually $713,000 above budget. And, and revenues for the, from the state and intergovernmental revenue seem to be, you know, have, have taken a nice little swing the other way from what we've seen in the past, so. A little different different administration in Augusta that I think makes a difference in that regard. Looks like interest is way up as well. It's finally rebounded back to some of the, you know, there was a time where we were, we frankly stopped budgeting for interest because it was just yeah. so poor. And part of that interest, just to be um, actual, does include some uh, premium from bonds. Okay. Is that true? He might have pulled those out. So, okay. he any, might have pulled so, those maybe, out. so maybe that really is all interest. Yeah, <laughs> uh, any one of these, and, and certainly on the uh, next couple of pages, the expenditures, uh, we can do further research to really uh, pinpoint exactly why we had this budget performance, positive or negative. I, I don't think we're necessarily capable of answering too many details no, below that, but if there are things that you're really interested in, we can dig deeper and, and give you some detail. And then next would say two. Really quick, I won't, we won't go into details. It's just, what is rescue donations? Uh, the We bill for rescue um, ambulance services, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially all of the monies that we collect from rescue billing goes into a special revenue fund, and then the fire chief determines how much of that he can use to help offset his budget. And this million is what he feels he can pull out of that and still be able to buy equipment out of the reserve account. So that's why it's called a donation. It's a mm -hmm. donation to the town, in a way, right? That does seem a little... Um, <laughs> a little odd. <laughs> description a little, yeah. How much, how much is in that reserve he's got? Yeah, it's... Oh, I'll have been to look it up, but yeah. The good news is we're able to, um, to, to buy all capital items related to EMS operations uh, using these reserves. So um, there are expenses that exceed the revenues, uh, but we're able to, to provide all the capital needs out of out of those reserves. I think he's been buying most of his ambulances, rescue vehicles from that reserve. I mean, I, I think at some point I think it gets to a, a you know a future agenda item suggested by Betsy about it'd be really great to kind of get a sense of where all these right. what the reserve accounts are and where they are and what are some of the balances on, mm -hmm. just so we get kind of a lay of the land of, of where. In, those when you receive the financial statements, uh, most of those are showing up under special revenue funds. So in the after you get past the general fund, there's going to be a section. There's one big section that's called department grants, and uh, you know that that has like 
a bazillion grants. It has a whole bunch of different smaller ones, but uh, most of the big ones are showing individually in that, I think it's exhibits B or C. Yeah, so we can, I mean, that's going to be, that was a request of some new general yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll yeah. circle back to that. Good. Yeah. Great. And um, just out of curiosity, the way the town works, are most of those set up by town council vote, by are. policy, by There's ordinance? Ordinance or, varies. ordinance or council vote, although I think there might be a couple out there that need some action. Some action. Or, okay. or the action was made and no one can find it. No but one the can general, find it. The general right. rule okay. is council creates the account and you control the account in terms of how the monies flow from it. We, uh, we're not authorized to, to use those funds without council approval. There are four, now six, I guess, funds um, that we show under special revenues that Per GASB standards, Governmental Account Standards Board standards, we have to show in the general fund because they're really not monies necessarily that we're collecting from outside their internal sources. So the um, HRA credit and debit plans, I think the council recently approved, those are just internal. So even though we're showing them over here, earning interest, keeping them segregated, we really have to show them in the general fund. So you'll see. Okay. It's, it's going to be a whole it's be fun an interesting, complicated yeah. conversation. Yeah. A whole, whole fun evening. Of yeah, yeah. To have it. So then A2 were just the expenditures where we are uh, last year. So in total, we received 86.6 .6 and we spent 87.7. .7. So um, that will probably be a comment one of the bond rating agency will have because we've spent more than probably spent more than we actually collected. The offsets are all under the other financing sources and uses, but they tend to disregard that. I don't know why, because to me it's all part of us, you know. So uh, the end result is that we did increase our fund balance, I think, by five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, roughly. So that's a very, very quick overview. Yeah. But so, I th so I think, I mean, unless others have, I mean, we're going to dive into it a little deeper once we, we have the, I think this is just helpful to kind of, there's no surprises, we kind of know where we are. Mm -hmm. Tom, you suggested by the end of the week you'll have something up. Um, and if you think about, I know, as it came up in our planning, strategic planning session, town council members want some of these documents too, so I think we'll, after we conclude tonight with numbers as of 1231 plus mm -hmm. these, think about what we can get out to everybody. Good. Can I ask one, one more question? How do you define enterprise funds and are they reflected in these numbers? So, I mean, do you have an enterprise fund for rec, recreate because they run themselves or do we not have any enterprise funds? Or? We don't technically. The only enterprise fund that I always considered that we had was food services, but okay. they're, they're always they're in always the deficit. Under, so, so the right. auditor okay. said, no, they're not really an enterprise fund. So, okay. so we don't really have any. Okay. The only thing close would be community services. Be they're good. about 91% right. self funded, but uh, not 100%. And there's some definite reasons why they can't close okay. that final gap. Okay. So, yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. In the interest of, oh, oh why am I? Anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could pivot us to the 1231 statements. And, and what we've done, both for sort of the knowledge of, of Betsy and John, is we've asked them to kind of do an executive summary sheet that tries to pull out to us what they think they want to highlight for things that we may want to see or talk about kind of an executive summary, if you will, of all the numbers. And so that's usually the first thing, then there's it's the exhibit. So if you want to kind of walk us through that, yeah, that'd be great. Very helpful. So um, this is also posted on our finance website, and I believe it is out there mm -hmm. now. Uh, it, so really, we wanted to thank Dave Buffard, who, who was our assessor, retired back in December. And um, he put together and worked very hard with he and his staff on uh, the, the two years of revaluation and also the conversion of the software. So they did, they did a great job with that. Um, we have a lot of positive indicators. You know, the excise revenues are up. Over last year again. Are, are doing well. The building permits are also up. Parking violations, I don't know if this is good or bad, but those are up. Is that, yeah, 
Is that all Higgins Beach that's driving that? It's uh, a little bit both. Higgins predominantly, but um, Angelo, uh, the Marine Resource Officer, made a concerted effort at uh, the co-op as well this year. That's something new and different. <coughs> Um, as I mentioned, the state seems to be stepping up their uh, general purpose aid. While it's just a little bit below, it's still not doing too bad. State revenue sharing is up. Um, general assistance revenues are up, but that's because our expenditures are up. The state reimburses us somewhere between 50 and 70 percent, depending on the type of claim, I guess. And so those revenues are up, but like I said, the expenditures are also up, and those are, at this point, overspent from what their budget was. So, yeah, a couple things on that first page. Can you, and this gets to our reserve accounts. I understand that it's what you had just talked about earlier. Ten percent of our budget is we should have reserves of about 8.8, .8, right? Is what? 8.8, correct, yeah. And we have 8.2. But then you say, which is 9.32%, but then you say to bring the town into compliance yeah, about 10%, we need 155. Is, is that math? The, I think I might have messed up there. Maybe that's supposed 600. to be 655 or something. I don't know. I'll have okay. to check that. It's the difference between the 8.8 8 and the Yeah, yeah, that's, it's, that, yeah. That's what I was trying to track. I was thinking I was, <laughs> well, missing, I was, I was missing something. So I was, no big deal. Just, I was talking about it here, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I only had 150 on that other page. So it, unless like, there's a carry forward from... 2019? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't think so. I think that's a plain okay. out typo. So, so we'll fix that. Yeah, so I didn't know if, if we're missing something. So we're basically about 655 off of where we, by policy, or at least by policy. Yeah, and, okay. and Peter, you'll recall, we we used, our standard used to be 8.3%. Yeah. We yeah. raised the bar on ourselves and put it to 10. So, uh, you know, I like to think that you know, we're beating what historically the policy yeah. was, uh, okay. and we're inching toward our new a new target. So and, and we are we're making positive progress gains. each year. Making Slow progress. but yeah. progress. And I think that's what like the rating agencies uh, because they are such a big part of mm -hmm. the amount we borrow and everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, they really uh, they really look at that. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that that'll be a theme. I think that's what why we did it. We want to show that continuous mm -hmm. sort of it's true. It's a good story to tell. Yep. Uh, just for Betsy and John's benefit, uh, that is a huge component of at least Moody's, uh, one of the big rating agencies. Uh, they highly value fund balance. Uh, one, it's important to have a policy, which we do. Secondly, uh, you need to follow the policy. And so we've got a good story to tell, that we've got a policy that we continually um, ask more of ourselves and we adhere to it. And that's, a, that's an important part of the conversation. Well, just a little out of <laughs> left field, but um, do you, when do you tap into that ever? Or do you just continue to try to grow try it? Try not to. Um, when I came, and I, um, it's not because of me, but there was a practice, and the school does it for other reasons, but uh, uh, many committees will actually include it as a revenue, a starting point in your budget. Uh, we don't budget use of any fund balance, and, and, uh, and rarely, if ever, have to go there. I was proposing we go there for the unique situation with the public safety building. We found other ways to fill that gap. Um, so uh, it really should be there for a rainy day. So is the view. only way it will grow is if... Our results come in better than anticipated or budgeted? Essentially, I, I can tell you uh, kind of a dirty little secret in the municipal world. Many communities will use their overlay account um, mm -hmm. as a way of underhandedly um, funding uh, their fund balance. Uh, but, but really, it's frowned upon, if not um, um, shunned. Uh, you should not budget for that purpose, uh, and we don't. It doesn't look like we're very far off of our target anyways. The assessor <coughs> has the ability uh, when he commits taxes to assess up to 5% to put towards overlay, which I don't think we've ever come Which is an ungodly amount. Oh, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that's at the expense of the tax rate. So uh, there's this um, very delicate balance we're trying to strike to make sure we're f adequately funding expected abatement needs. That's what its purpose is, but not overfunding it such that uh, it's affecting the mill rate. And you also, as a town council, and a lot of the communities that have that overlay is using to fund their, to improve their fund balance, they are also a government form that is the assessor by title as well. So whereas you guys are not the assessor and don't have the authority to set the overlay, you don't have quite the same freedom to use that overlay line for that purpose. 
The, yeah, the only area, and Peter, you can attest to this, where the council kind of interceded in the assessor's role in that regard was uh, preparing for what was an expected additional expense for settling some of the tax appeals, <coughs> and it was really kind of preparing for the future. And so the, uh, the assessor at the time understood that and was willing, with kind of the blessing of council, to uh, include a, a much higher overlay than would normally be required. And we do include overlay in our budget process. We but do. You do it. They should be aligned, hopefully. Yeah. Because we do expect abatements during the course of the year. I mean, you know, a revalue year years yeah. are probably revalue years are different, and we'll higher. talk about yeah. some of that experience. And but on a typical year, we probably would get maybe somewhere between fifty and two hundred thousand worth of uh, abatements. And I think it's also just really important to notice note that we are not out of compliance with the policy regarding fund balance. So that ten percent is a goal. We are within the policy guidelines. We have not fallen below the level that we, by policy, are allowed yeah, to fall below. Great. Great. And, and the only thing I thought offer um, is that part of the reason we focused on it because as as we look down the road and what we are facing in capital projects, it, this is one thing that the bond readers really look at. We've mm -hmm. had the good fortune of our bond rating improving. Mm -hmm. It probably isn't going to improve from here, but we really want not to have it Go down. degrade because that, I mean, that's a couple basis points, right? Yeah, but, that, that's real money. But what we're talking with the debt numbers we're looking at, that, that, that'd be a real, that would be real money. <laughs> it, it is. Okay. Some of the negative things? So you know, some of the negative yeah. or items of concern are the, well, it shows we're 54% spent. Uh, part of that has to do with the library. They get a quarterly allotment, and they, you know, through December, they've gotten their third quarter allotment. Yeah, so timing. that was a timing thing, which uh, some of these really are. Uh, the two big ones, of course, are the uh, general assistance. Legal expenditures are over right now by about 56000 We still have six months to go, so I would expect that that to increase. A little bit about um, what, what's driving sort of the unanticipated legal fees, is it all a... It's a combination of things. Uh, we've got a number of uh, matters of litigation that we're fighting uh, in, in dealing with. We, we have another number of other uh, needs. The, the marijuana ordinance in production required a fair amount of legal input. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, it's no one thing. It's just a, a number of uh, highly important things that we need legal support for. And to be honest, we have chronically underfunded uh, the legal line. Yeah, that's um, But I mean, we... Are we over the hump, or do you expect us to be? I, I believe we case? are. It, certainly, in the respect of the Proud's Neck appeal, the the, yeah. the the gift that keeps on giving, um, or costing, I should say, uh, given where we are with the recent court decision, there's the potential for it to be appealed to uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, our attorneys think that that's highly unlikely, so uh, we don't expect to be incurring additional fees there, and that's been. Uh, you know, I'll do the final reconciliation, but I bet we've spent half a million dollars in legal fees uh, defending that case yeah, uh, over the years. So that's welcomed. Um, so I, I, I can give a, a more thorough accounting of where that is, but I think it's a lot of different things that, that add up. And on the general assistance, I mean, we've, we've spent the whole annual budget, right? For general assistance, So right. where do we think that's going to go for the next six months? I think yeah. there's a report. I'll speak to that. Um, so uh, Scarborough historically has had his, his had remarkably low general assistance uh, need and therefore cost, uh, shockingly so. Uh, in fact, we've been asked to report uh, kind of on statewide um, uh, questionnaires, and um, they often call us and say, are you sure that's the number? It's just remarkable. So this year we've seen an uptick, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, placement of some of the new arrivals in, in this country. The Vesta Housing Project also came online this year. I think that's uh, a location where uh, a number of folks are, are housed at this point. Um, these are matters of state law. Uh, so long as they're eligible, they, they are eligible and we must pay. And uh, frankly, from my perspective, I, I welcome the, them to our community and, our, and the diversity they, they bring, frankly. Uh, we do get 70% reimbursement. So when we're talking about kind of gross expenditures, um, there's a there's an offset. Um, what we've done, we know the expenses through uh, mid-year, and we've extrapolated those same 
we'll say the December costs out throughout the fiscal year, it would have us over expending that budget by about fifty-four thousand dollars. But then when you consider reimbursement, it's a net of about uh, twenty-one thousand. Now, there could be additional things that come our way between now and then, but this is our best estimate based on what we know today. And that's so, assuming that the current folks continue to be eligible and stay within our community during that period. So, so just the accounting on the, on the revised appropriation for the whole year was, call it 34. <coughs> we expended 36. Is that gross or net? That must be gross. That's gross. And the net somewhere, the 7% is a revenue number someplace? will show under intergovernmental revenues that's built into that number. Okay, so you're talking about you just mm -hmm. shared is that you think on a full year basis, the gross less what we get back will cause a budget variance about 21, okay? Right, when you consider the revenue offset, correct. But you'll see that expense line um, over by about 54,000 if you look simply at the expense line, but if, uh, you need to consider the offset. And then I guess the big one is, can you talk about the abatements? That looks like, if I read it right, right now we're sitting at close to almost 690. Correct. In the overlay, we had 298. Mm -hmm. That will be a, a, a depressor to the budget, right? Yes. Yes, by that amount. Um, and there's still more experience, though. I think given the efforts of the assessor in terms of inviting people into his office. Uh, technically, the abatements, uh, they have 180 days, so it's sometime in early March is the deadline for abatements to be cut off. So there's still some experience. Yeah. But I think given how thorough and the conversation we had across the whole community last fall, um, I'm hopeful, I'll say, that uh, folks have already come forward. Uh, there could be more. There's also a number of commercial uh, abatements that have been granted. Um, that are reflected here. So you know, that was another, so it was like the Walmart. <coughs> Everything, yeah, this is all the money that we've approved in this fiscal year is shown in this line. Yep, Walmart and Sam's. So, so all things being equal, we're gonna be about 400 in the whole. That's what we know that today. Excise taxes are running ahead. Correct. So, so are you anticipating by year end we're gonna be over budget? Well, if you're looking to offset with excise, uh, well, we need the whole, I, the whole net. Well, I was going to say that Tom, Tom put into place a curtailment order. So, in terms of trying to estimate where we're going to be at the end yeah. of the year, it's I think it's going to be in a better position than if he hadn't put one in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's going to be kind of difficult to to really well, come up with you, a, an so estimate. I mean, I, all I'm trying to look at that, do you think we're going to be on target, over target, or under target? Well, how much is excise power? Only four percent up over budget at this point, um, yeah. but uh, I'd like to think that we do not have to tap into fund balance that we're going to end the year um, even. So that's, that's what, the goal. Why the curtailment? Is it because of the abatements, or was it driven by something else? Uh, abatements, uh, legal fees. I mean, those two alone. Um, you know, at mid-year, with the knowledge that we're over half a million dollars overspent <coughs> on those two lines, that gave me pause. Uh, and really how it sets us up for next year as well, uh, that I, I really want to avoid any reason for dipping into fund balance. Uh, so can you explain what curtailment means for your staff and how it practically has an effect? Yeah, so I, I'll send you the memo that I sent to the staff, and, and I did this in early December, so again, we're trying to catch it as early as we can. Essentially, it limits any non-essential spending, so uh, there are things that need to happen in this town for it to run. But uh, anything non-essential, you know, travel, training, uh, any kind of equipment purchases, those sorts of things, I do give staff the ability to come and make a special request mm -hmm. and make their pitch and argument. Um, I, I really can't say anyone has yet, but that, that might happen. Um, so I don't do this lightly, but I do it really in, in anticipation of what I know today and what I expect is coming our way. And I think it was the appropriate measure. I also say when I put this directive out, it was at the same time I was suggesting we use fund balance to fund uh, additional public monies safety. to public safety buildings. So I w it's kind of <coughs> that went into the calculus. Um, when that didn't happen, I, I kept this in place and we'll, and we'll keep it in place. I have have you done that before? 
I have. Can it's been me? done jointly with the, the school board uh, and superintendent, uh, given other circumstances. I don't remember what those were, frankly. Uh, but we've done it on our own, and we've done it jointly. This one is on our own. On our own. Okay, so the school is not under curtailment. No, I did not make any overtures uh, and ask for their voluntary participation in, in this effort. Should we in the spirit of one town, one budget? Uh, certainly to make them aware that we're doing this. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't really see it my role to, to push very hard in that regard. No, I mean, but it's, it's a great yep. topic for the joint finance committees. So maybe that is something we should try to, because I mean, certainly the abatements are, it is what it is. It's We all share in that in that pain point. Sure. I'll, I'll certainly raise, raise this with the superintendent, and I would encourage you to raise it with your yeah. okay. board of colleagues as well. Okay. The final piece, I guess, that I would say on the summary is that um, with regards to the debt service, we budgeted, the budget was in place before we had final numbers. Uh, we do plan to, probably within the next month, we'll be going, uh, starting the whole bonding process for the items for this year and anything we haven't bonded in the more recent past. So uh, that process will be starting shortly. Does the, the turf not being approved impact this year's budget in any way? Or that have all been in terms of future it's, it's budgeted, so it has a, a an appropriation, but it also has an estimated revenue, I think, that offsets it. But they were it's to be bonded, so since that failed, the bonds won't happen either. So both just stay there Shut with, with no revenue. <coughs> There, there are some expected expenses that um, we're trying to get our arms around and we'll be coming to you with to get the th field playable for the spring. Um, and my proposal will be use the, the reserve account that was created for that purpose uh, to keep us in, in play. <coughs> um, I think it's a topic that will be discussed at the joint meeting on February 12th with, with the Board of Education. Um, to be honest, it doesn't really impact <coughs> any town services. Uh, we run, we essentially run no programming uh, on that field. So if it comes offline, it really has no impact on us. It has massive impact on the school. And uh, um, so uh, it's an issue that will be talked about. Uh, we're devising a, a proposal to bring this back to the voters in some fashion. We have to sort that through, um, perhaps on the June ballot to see, because the problem doesn't go away, it only gets worse. So it's a topic that's topic for topical and, and we need to, we can't forget about it. Yep. Okay. So I don't know if you have any specific questions on the, on the other statements that are there. The, um, just for um, anyone who's new to this process, what we usually do is the summary, then we have the balance sheet and we uh, compare it from this year to last year at the same time and we do that with the revenues and the expenditures. As the uh, elected officials, you're also responsible for essentially all of the funds. That includes, um, you know, these special revenue funds on page six and capital funds and cemetery and scholarship funds. So uh, we give you kind of a synopsis of, of, in total of those funds. Those don't generally, capital has budgets, but most of the other ones do not. And um, then we also have kind of a breakdown of the school department into, I'm not sure this is actually the breakdown that they use, but it's an easier breakdown for us to do than to try and figure out how they break this out. So, um, and this is the same format I believe we use in the audit. The intention is to give you a full snapshot. Um, you know, we're always willing to accommodate and to meet your needs in terms of what depth and, and type and presentation of information. It sounds like this council wants to be heavily involved in looking at the quarterlies on, or on a consistent mm -hmm. basis, and so uh, please give us feedback if there's a different format that you prefer. And then the last page is just uh, some selected revenues, and it shows revenues by town departments and uh, where things stand. I mean, the only the only quick question I'm sure you've got a real quick answer would be just on the balance sheet. There's a pretty significant difference in, <coughs> it, at cash on hand is December 31, 18 versus now and. Difference about 3.6 million, and then the accounts payable also has a difference of about 5 million. What's what's driving those two sort of <coughs> significant events? I think um, a lot of it has to do with the timing of expenditures. 
it could be. Oh, I haven't why really. Why would that impact cap? Oh, you mean you paid prepaid? Well, we we have um, we we probably paid a lot of our accounts payables by December thirty first that we didn't pay as of you know two thousand eighteen. So that would impact how much cash because we record we record the expenditures, we book the payable, and then when we pay it, we you know right. offset the payable and take it out of cash. I mean, but was that a change in practice? I mean, I, I was thinking it may have had something to do with the public safety board and cash. Well, I was going to say that because it's just about four million more on the capital um, public safety building side of expenditures, but. Um, this is just the general fund, yeah, so it really should show should. in there. On the other hand, all of our, uh, in the financials, all of our cash is commingled into the general fund. So everything that gets spent in every other fund hits the general fund first, and then there's transfers in and out of the other funds to offset those. So there might be a payable in, cap uh, in the capital budget that um, hasn't been journaled between the two yet. And then your investment income comes from, you, you take a portion of the general fund and you put it in a, some kind of interest bearing account, right? Right. Any monies, uh, most of the general fund monies or all of the monies that we're, uh, we have on hand that we don't really need right away to use are invested. And so uh, we have, some of it is just general fund money, so we know exactly what it is. Other monies are commingled in, in a bank, so it has special revenues, capital projects, and fortunately the banks uh, break those out sub-account for us, so we know how much is interest goes to each one of the specific projects, and uh, someone upstairs, you know, my accountant posts those on a monthly basis. So maybe just monitor for us, and when we look at January or whatever, hopefully it's time and it bounces back. Just, I mean, that, that kind of jumps off the page as being unusual, or different than Prior yeah. years, because uh, I remember it being pretty consistent. consistent yeah, I think pattern. the anomaly is just you're taking two snapshots in time, and yeah. Yeah, I'm not even sure which is the one that might be the anomaly, but it, it, it's jarring when you look at that number. Right. <coughs> well, on page six, the uh, special total special revenue fund um, is that what you were referring to when you said it all gets rolled up? So, like the beach and the field fund and the other things that you were mentioning it all goes into that one bucket of total special revenue fund or is that something different no that's everything so that's, it's so like the, the project hope it's any grant monies we have it uh, would be the turf reserve we okay. have unemployment in there the uh, so the um the, the herd park was is coming up and there was conversation about paying for that out of a reserve so is that Part, would that come out of part of that, Tom, that total special rev reserve fund? Right. So the top, the top section are the expenditures for all of these different funds, and then in the bottom section, they're the same funds, but they're the revenues. Okay. I think with that one, there's not adequate funds to pay uh, the total cost of that project. So uh, as I understand it, the proposal <coughs> will likely be to pay uh, its, its relative portion of debt service from reserves into the future. Oh, I think okay, I see. Yeah. You'd be looking for the balance on those accounts, not the... Yeah, you're not going to yeah. be able to... Yeah, I think that that's the discussion that we're likely to have maybe right. at your next meeting. That yeah, information is not easily obtained from this that. format. And, um, just a quick question on page um, three. The um, accrued payroll up over 2018 is that um, is that uh, is that include benefits and is it new positions also along with um, salary increases or what what drove the increase between eighteen and nineteen? I think it's date? just salary adjustments. Okay. Between it, the two. It years. would include any new positions too. Uh, it would not include benefits though. Is that right? Um, it could. I'm, I'll have to see what makes that that up, but uh, it could. Okay. If there's any payables out there, like Social Security, that we're required to pay, that might be considered a accrued payroll. So the last line on page eight is uh, TIFs and interfund transfers. I don't know if I have the right. It's showing the estimated revenue at 1.8 million. I thought what we had in the budget was closer to 1.2. <coughs> that probably includes um, overlay. 
So there might be some funds in there for that. So it might not be apples to apples. Correct. It looks like we're ahead of budget. Uh, usually these are transfers that I make on a once a year basis at the end of the year. Okay. This could be um, some of the credit enhancement agreement payments that if it were made <coughs> that we owed, such as, you know, the Bessie affordable housing. Uh, we pay <coughs> New England. The way it usually works is they pay us their taxes and then uh, we pay whatever portion back to them. And that's probably what most of that is. I mean, not, not for this evening, but, you know, probably going forward, we'd like to have an agenda item to probably talk about how we can see sort of the accounting for the CA <coughs> funds and where it is, how much by project that type of thing. So we mm -hmm. can, I think that'll be important to look at as we move down the pathway. We do have, I keep track of, um, I have all of the basic information of, like, here's the, the credit enhancement agreement, here's the number of years, here's the base pay, the base amount, and then by year we track how much is supposed to be calculated. And um, I do do it on an annual basis because this TIF is the, the most recent one has changed a little bit in how we do it. Uh, so uh, half of the payments probably have been made. For most of them, we haven't paid Crossroads yet. Yeah, let me just a, make a point here. This is something we're, we're, we've not paid any monies out uh, on the down CEA yet. Uh, and so we have a, a very good system in place. We're kind of doing the final sorting through that. One of the things that has occurred to me, unlike most credit enhancement agreements, where you, in most cases you have a single entity, so it's pretty easy. Here's the property, here's the tax. You send the bill back to a single person. With the Downs credit enhancement arrangement, um, at build-out, there will be hundreds, if not a thousand, different property owners, potentially. Uh, as each as they create lots, sell them off to private interests, it's that private party that pays the taxes, but the reimbursement goes back to a different entity. And so, this is probably a detail that you don't need to be concerned with, but as Ruth says, we don't reimburse until taxes are paid. And so typically, um, we do that after second half. But just imagine with hundreds of taxpayers, some paying full in the fall, some paying it in two equal payments over the year, uh, yet the beneficiary of this is going to want to get paid at some point, and so we can't rightfully hold up reimbursement until all taxes are paid, because all sorts of things happen, right? People don't pay the taxes, so we've got to come up with a, a system, um, and I'm glad we're talking about it now, because this is going to be with us for a while. I want to just make very clear, though, that <clears throat> we would not be reimbursing on anything that hasn't been paid. So okay. right. um, that, if an if a no. individual you, you taxpayer, yeah. Yeah. you just sent <laughs> it away for the whole budget. <clears throat> right. So right. let's say 95% of the homeowners, uh, uh, property owners at the Downs have paid their taxes and 5% have not. It would be inappropriate for us to withhold payment waiting for that other 5%. But we're only going to reimburse 40% of when the 95% which yeah, have been so paid. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Sure. And then uh, we would prefer cutting one check, you know, after sometime mid-April. Say you know after the second half is due, where you would expect the majority of taxes have been paid. There is, is something in the credit enhancement agreement that says we take what is owed or what they've paid and subtract what hasn't been paid, and that didn't quite make sense to me. So, which is another reason we haven't done anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of added. I've got a, at the end here. We'll have a list of other fun evenings we can spend <laughs> talking about <laughs> stuff. But I think that. The accounting for the CA is going to be really important, both from a budget perspective, because you're going to be yeah. looking at tax revenues, but we also got to model what might be going back out the door, and it sounds like the timing of that yeah. might be tricky. The point so. of me bringing it up is that we're thinking very hard about this and making sure we start off right. Yeah. Um, yeah. We also have some good news to report on some other CEAs uh, that will be retiring soon, so well, it is it's part of the conversation. And just so you know, there was a piece within that that said we're supposed to take some of the funds and put them into a reserve, and then within 10 days we're supposed to pay them back. But just to be um, sort of conforming, we did take a portion of the funds and stick them into that, uh, I forget what they call it, but the it's reserve sub -account. is sub-account. And uh, so those funds are there, and they're not going to go anywhere until everyone agrees what we owe. Yeah. They haven't been paid out. They're just sitting, they're just sitting, sitting in the books. Okay. And I know 
Does anybody have any other questions? Just really quick, yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I understand on page six the, um, the special revenue fund. So year to date, it says we ex expended um, a little over $2 million. So that's things we've paid out of that revenue fund? Yes. And what type of things have we paid out of that revenue oh, fund? I knew you were going to ask me that. Let me think. What's the special revenues? It's um, it could be grants because the like public safety has a whole uh, uh, quite a few grants. Project Hope is out there, so any expenditures we're making for that are coming out of here. Um, so mostly grants. Can we do some? So that would just be when we when we were looking at the, you know, this kind of maybe report that we might build based on reserve funds, you know, that would be really good to see what came out, you know, uh, and then what's going to be encumbered, you know. So like the, you know, this was a project hope grant. This was a this. I mean, that seems like a high number to me just for grants, but you know, there must oh, have been. It's more than grants. It's yeah, a, there must have been something in there that yeah. we spent something for before my time. I would oh. be would be my guess. Part of it has to do with the housing. The housing initiative fund. The housing initiative fund. That the council authorized some amount of money to go towards. I Bessie, forget who it Bessie is. Bessie Commons. Bessie Commons. That's built into that too. Okay. So the is the preserve. land trust fund in there as well? The well, how will we do this? We can report back yeah, to you yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. just so we don't speculate. Um, you know, I, w I, I appreciate your interest in the level of detail, but I also want to encourage you as a body to do your best to uh, avoid the temptation, if you will. Not that I'm looking to hide anything, but I want to make sure that you're giving us the policy level guidance that we need. Uh, and there's a lot to be talking about just at that level. So right. just a cautionary note. Yeah, I think uh, once we build the report, you don't really have to talk about it at the detail level yep. because the report will actually show the ins and outs of the reserve funds, what the balance is, Correct. what's encumbered, and what's been spent. So once that's built, really, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on it. It might take a little time to build the reserve mm -hmm. report. But. I'm just I'm nodding my head, but I don't know what work is involved with the way you described that. Yeah, absolutely. But Ruth seems yep. smiling, so well, that's good. We, we yeah. have most of that, at least through mm -hmm. June 30th. Right. You know, we do it once a year and do the catch-up on the rest of them. So okay, we have a good Thanks. portion of that. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think that we'll kick this to another agenda. Meeting, yeah. 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 So, so that's that's pretty much the quarterlies that we do. And like Tom said, if there's anything you want to see different, you know, changed up, whatever, please let us know. And so you'll be pleased to hear that one of our goals as a council was to have you do this in front of the full council once a quarter. Um, oh, hey. <laughs> and I honestly, I thought the format seemed pretty good to start. I, Else had, hmm. I think we'll probably card. have to find a way to simplify it for more visual presentation for that format, but that's something we could probably should get some guidance from you on because we want to make sure we're doing giving you the information you want, but in a format and in a bite-sized pieces, so to speak. Was that that workshop? Yeah, the quarterly workshop. So you can dive down a little in a workshop, mm -hmm. I would presume so. But I think the intent was to have one or two departments come, and the deep dive would Each focus time, on those yes. departments. Each time, yes. Okay. Departments. Yep. Yeah. But, but I think Tom's suggestion is good. Like when going way back to the beginning of the conversation, when the page comes and does their annual review, they pull out a couple tidbits and make like a PowerPoint. So it's mm -hmm. it's really easy mm -hmm. to see what you should really pay attention to, and maybe so. Yeah, we can work on that in the format. And I I think this committee is actually tasked with kind of sorting through. How we're going to present and what we're going to present. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's something we ought to be mindful of. Add to the agenda. <laughs> and be mindful. Um, happy anniversary. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank Have you. fun this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank yes. you very much for being here on your anniversary night. So <coughs> hopefully you worked up an appetite. I did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yeah. All right. So I think we've got a fair amount to move through because we are still talking about the TIF policy. Um, maybe an item B, Tom, mm -hmm. this was just the purpose of item B was to think about as we're <coughs> doing the budget process sure. and we're setting the stage of sort of where we think we might be, what some things are we should think about. So the mm -hmm. first one that comes up, and we've already talked about it, the Beach Community Tax Appeal. I know that we had at one point in time had established an overlay that we think covered our liability if there were no further judgments against us. 
I think. So yeah. are we? So are we at a point? Um, one is that reserve still there? It's still on the books, right? <coughs> so we don't need to reserve any additional funds. Are we accumulating yeah. interest at this point on the balance? It wasn't a reserve. It was uh, a, overlay, a, an inflated overlay. So that has now become fund balance. Yep. So it's still there. Yes, it's there. It's yep. available for your use at your direction. Yep. It is accruing, accumulating interest. But if you use it, you're going to reduce your no, no, correct no, fund no. balance. Yes, yes I, 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 not at the It's in the well, undesignated fund balance. Is that okay? correct? Yeah, we've not done anything to specifically allocate that restricted for any reason. So it, it just sits there as part of the total fund balance. Okay. Um, all indications with the, uh, are with the recent court decision in our favor, upholding our position that there's no further financial liability. Right. Having said that, the, so the final appeal uh, is to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'll just note the – well, I'll let you speculate on the likelihood of that. Even if they file – the Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court has the right to decide which cases they hear and which ones they don't. Our lawyers are one amazed that they're even filing, and two think it's highly unlikely that the U.S. Supreme Court would take such a case up. But, but I've lost track of where we were on the in, the interest component. At one point, it was seven percent. Is it? The decision ruled entirely in our favor, so uh, it's a. It, for a portion of it was 7%, for another portion it was 3%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have cut those checks based on that decision. So we were paid in full, so to speak. The uh, the exposure that we were preparing for was about double that amount. Um, and at this point, um, we're not directed to, to pay out any more to them. And so we would need to have an adverse ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court for that to be our So aside obligation. from the final lawyer's fees... We're, we should be paid up. And, and we've already paid our legal fees as well. Okay. So so the money that's still in the overlay we're not going to need? Or are you saying Correct. with the money in the overlay? It's in we're, fund balance now. It's well, in, it's in fund balance, right. Right. But right. No, we, we, uh, we, we actually cut checks to all the taxpayers based on that ruling, sent it to them, they cashed them. Uh, and the ruling was in support of that decision. Oh, okay. So, so we're paid in full. Oh, okay. So that's good. So that's not it is because the reason I brought it up is to think if there's any timing issues for the one. So that's good. Um, Piper Shores tax assessment appeal is that? I yeah, know that there's two. You can. Yeah, there's two issues that, that potentially have financial bearing. One is the assessment appeal. Uh, they were heard before the local board of assessment review, which is the normal process. Um, last month, and the board ruled and upheld the assessor's position. So. Their next recourse is to go to the State Board of Assessment Appeal, which uh, we believe they will, since they did not put up really a vigorous defense or any defense locally. It's kind of checking the box yeah. so they can move on to the next step. So that will be, uh, that's, that's unfolding, that, that will be heard sometime this spring, and the decision I think by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, there's a second matter that's uh, related because it's Piper Shores, but uh, it has to do with the exemption piece. And that's a matter I'm sorry, of the what? They've, they're claiming that some portion of their property is actually tax exempt. Oh, right. And okay. we are not agreeing with them. Uh, that matter is in Superior Court as we speak. Uh, we both moved for summary judgment and we're awaiting a judge's decision. Uh, it's a bench trial. And I thought, so, so all I'm trying to do with all of these. Mm -hmm. is determine whether, as you prepare the budget, these are anything that we need to think about making sure we have reserves and or an accrued accounts to cover. I thought part of Piper Shores had to do with the square footage, maybe, and... and, and <coughs> I think they already got abated. That, yeah, the the well, that's my question. The, that? the assessor uh, uh, did reduce their overall value okay. by something in the order of $3 million. Okay, so that would be in the 689. And the abatement has been paid out in full. Uh, okay, so they're, a, they're asking for something uh, more than that. And uh, the local board agreed that the assessor took the appropriate measures, okay. made the appropriate abatement, and didn't agree that any more was due. Okay, so at this point, we don't think there's an outstanding. I, there's the potential for more exposure right, right. if they're successful at the state board. Okay. Um, I, I can't predict. Yeah. I, I do like uh, the way our case is positioned and the actions the assessor's taken. Great, because that, that was a piece I knew that that squirt. So that sounds like that's been resolved. 
We do know that there's the modular classroom. Sure. Yeah, I don't have <laughs> first-hand knowledge. It's something in the order of sixty, maybe yeah. as much as eighty thousand dollars over uh, over budget, so to speak. Uh, I, of the I don't ones already installed, right? The ones installed. Yes, these are the ones that are in place in use at eight corners. Uh, there were some unexpected, unanticipated costs. Obviously, I'm, <coughs> I don't know enough to speak to them intelligently. Do we know correctly. if they're going to be looking for additional funds from the town for those, or if they're going to cover it within their own budget? Uh, I believe they're going to make the request. I think some members of council have indicated that there's other ways that they could close that gap. As you're aware, the council provided uh, capital funding um, in, in the budget that they have available to potentially cover that. They also have other funds, presumably, that they could use if they wished. Uh, but. My, uh, my understanding is they will be briefing you on the shortfall and making a request for additional use of school impact fees. And I think that may come up on the joint meeting on February 12th. Okay, so that, that'll, be, that'll be a known for the budget <coughs> process yes. once we get there, if that's... Again, the request is likely to be from the school impact fee, so it theoretically would not have a budget right. impact, but... Right. But a reserve it. So just foreshadowing a, a little bit, the, the way I read the impact fee <coughs> ordinance and the state statute, underneath it can't use impact fees for personal property it has to go to capital improvements I, I'd like to have clarification on that before we authorize releasing additional funds for trailer uh, classrooms and I'll ask again when it comes up yes just, please do uh, yeah okay and then total abatement we have talked about the only thing does this group want to see any greater detail on where sort of some of those abatements were commercial versus <coughs> the majority is residential I, no doubt um, in total there's about 40 million dollars in value that's been abated that produces the the dollar abatement of about seven hundred thousand uh, majority of which is in the residential area some abatements are as small as thirty dollars other ones are much larger um, <coughs> It does, this does uh, have implications for next year mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, think, think of it this way, we're starting next year uh, with a $40 million reduced valuation town-wide. Now, there are things happening all over town, and so there will be gains, and uh, Councillor Clucci has actually uh, offered to work with uh, staff uh, in the planning department and the assessing department to to come up with a different approach in terms of um, projecting what valuation is going to be. We do have a policy that, frankly, is not going to work well given a reval year and some of the anomalies because of that. Um, so I think we will have a better method of predicting that, but I think it's going to be a challenge. Um, you know, you might recall the policy has a cautious yeah. midpoint and optimistic. Um, you know, my gut tells me that uh, anything above cautious would be very risky, and we need to be more exact in that. So uh, I think that's going to put some upward pressure on the tax rate. So um, clearly, when you put the budget together, you didn't think there would be that much abatements. I mean, is that something that is normal? Or, I mean, I mean, uh, the, probably the answer to this is no, but, you know, did KRT... Do they have any liability for doing this, or they just kind of get off scot free? They were off by 700k. <laughs> That's okay. How does that work? Well, I don't think it's fair to say they were off by 700,000. <coughs> you know, they were off by one percent of value. Might be a better way to, to look at it. Um, uh, to answer your question, uh, there no, there's no liability to them for that. Um, I think we've been quite honest and forthright in, in our opinion that I wish we had more time to spend with their information before we committed taxes. I think a fair amount of these would have been caught before we went out the door. Uh, but of course that would have produced a higher tax rate too. And um, I, I think part of it was due to planning because when you do a, a <coughs> town-wide review, you do expect an increase in abatements and we basically plan for what we've historically had. And I, there's a right. rule of so thumb out there that I, I, I don't know right now. It may have been 5% right. of the increased value, something like that, that you usually plan for. Okay, yeah. So right. that was 15, my question. Did we, did we ask them ahead of time what we should budget for, and what did they say, or did we just budget the regular amount? Uh, they were not involved in the conversation around abatement, no. Okay. Uh, we were working overtime just to, just, just to get to the point of um, 
comfortable committing, and obviously, and, and many of the things are very understandable. Uh, you know, properties that they weren't able to access, not by their own fault, by uh, mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, with I think the commercial reval, we gave people a much shorter time period, right? To well, actually, that's a good frame of reference. So for the commercial mm -hmm. reval, the values would have <coughs> somewhere around two hundred twenty million. We had twenty million in abatements that following year. So the residential reval, the values went up six hundred some odd million, mm -hmm. and we've got forty million in abatements. So, this so there was actually more percentage wise. There was more percentage wise for the commercial than the commercial. Yeah. Okay. And, and some of the abatements that we're booking this year actually uh, were commercial industrial ones that uh, just took a while to kind of work through the process. It's a matter of timing. Um, but the Walmart, the Walmart one was right. huge. Right. And, the, and those didn't get decided until this fiscal year, so we're showing the abatement paid out this year. Tom, you made a statement just before that, though, saying the methodology change, the fact that there's $40 million that it's going to put upward pressure, that's because we're going to have lower organic growth, right? Is that what you're suggesting? No, we're just starting the year with a $40 million well, right. in the well, hole. But I mean, so that would... Um, I, I think we're actually going to have fairly typical, maybe even healthier growth generally in the valuation, but we're starting in a, de in a deficit situation. Right. Because of the 40. Correct. There's one other change coming with the... Uh, Increase in the uh, homestead exemption from 20 to 25,000. That's going to create a, another, I think, 12 million of your, your starting point is going to be 12 million lower than it was last year. Um, oh, but the good news is state reimbursement is going up from 60 2.5 to 70. Yeah. And so we actually benefit from that. In spite of the fact that there's an extra 5,000 for every homestead exemption, the reimbursement actually puts us in a better fiscal position. And, okay. and this is a kind of a, a related question to the reports we were looking at because um, we've now talked about commercial versus residential um, and a lot of times I haven't found a good report that breaks <coughs> revenue out of commercial versus residential does that exist is it Re revenue or value uh, well both but value for sure well you can get it by applying the tax rate to the value Sure. No, we, Assuming they pay. We, we, we can produce a report that will show you the difference the breakout, breakout yeah. of the tax base. Sure. Yeah, I just wonder if we already had one. We've done a couple of them through this process, and it's just about 82% residential, 18% commercial. Right, because people were using Oops. numbers the other night oh. at the public at the public comment. They were saying 77. I've, I've heard a whole lot of numbers thrown around with residential versus um, commercial. Part and of I, it depends if they're exempt. So we have a, right. lot of, a good number of either public, right. municipal, or exempt properties. So right. if you include those in the number, or if you don't. Right. Right. So some breakdown on that would, would mm -hmm. definitely be helpful. And I wasn't asking for a really new report. I was just kind of asking we out on the mm -hmm. website if there's already something that does do that. But every time I've dug through, I've only, only found just all revenues, um, not mm -hmm. anything broken down by commercial. Yeah, we can produce that easily. Sorry, that's kind of off the beaten topic a little bit. It's a little, it's not unrelated. But no, and then, yeah. now that we're through the full reval uh, of all sectors, uh, you know, that there is a rebalancing and there's a different percentage. Uh, prior to the reval, I think commercial was in the order of 23% of the tax base. I, so that's the first time I've heard of it. Frankly, it's now less than 20, apparently. Oh, I guess. And I might be speaking to value because of that exempt piece. I mean, there's a, all of the main health properties that are exempt. Right. right? Yeah. So they have value that we are, certainly are part of the tax base, but because they're exempt, the revenue that they Yeah, it would be great to show what's, what's exempt because, there's a, you know, as we build, t mm -hmm. you know, talk about what we're going to do to bring <coughs> growth to the town, that mix is very critical in a lot of those discussions. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doesn't doesn't Maine Health have about four hundred million of I property? Can't, I don't know. I thought it was. Uh, it's a big number. I'm not going to guess. It's not what I thought it was. But yeah. okay, so we're going to stop at seven thirty. What we have left, and kind of, um, we have the TIF policy. I don't know if we want to go there next. I fear that that's going to be 
length here, but we should start. Can you set the stage for us a little bit, Larissa? I sure. just, I know, let me set the stage a little bit. I know that this was started with ordinance. Was it Rules ordinance? and policy. Rules and policy. Passed it to finance. We had a work, we went through it one night. And I can't tell, I see the <coughs> comments that are on this draft. Did you make the changes yeah, that so we had talked about? Anything that was decided on as a finance committee yeah. in the November meeting, those changes have been made and are reflected in this document. Okay. So what you are seeing for comments in this document yeah. are things that were not resolved in that previous conversation. Okay. Or there are also some comments from staff that are asking for your, your okay. input to decide the direction you would like to see us go. Okay. So, um, the, and w one of the things that we are, we are finding challenging is that this document was built in Word. It was converted over to Doc, uh, to Google Docs. Somehow it got put back into Word, but worked on in the Google platform as a Word document. Mm -hmm. So what we thought was going to be easy to just kind of pull up past revi like the revision right, history right. in Google Docs, it's not there. And it wasn't, it wasn't um, track changes in the Word doc either. So we're hoping that, we, you know, that the, the document that you we have the original doc that came to you prior to that November meeting. And we have the document that we have here. So if you would like, we can go through the process and figure out where the words are different. We are confident that what's before you bearing the January date yep. reflects the input from the last finance committee meeting. Okay, <coughs> okay so I want to... Yes, but it, I, I'm sorry that there was this kind of technological mess, mishap that has made it so I can't show you redline <coughs> copies from November to January. Um, but a lot of the comments, if you remember in that November meeting, I was typing live your comments along the side. And so what we did was um, Tom, Karen, and I met, and we looked at those comments that went through. And um, not only was I resolving some of the comments during that November meeting, so once yep. you guys would come yep. into a conversation and you all would come <clears> to a consensus, I would hit resolve on the comment, and that would just adapt, adopt yep. whatever had been written in. Um, but then when Karen and Tom and I met, we went through the, the remaining comments, um, and those that from the minutes and from people's notes, we had discussion and resolution to, because if you remember, I left mid-meeting. So yeah. they were at that point, instead uh, of resolving as they went, they were taking notes instead. <laughs> so we um, resolved based on the notes and the minutes from that meeting. So what you have here is, are you know, items still to be addressed by you to direct us what you would like to see happen within this? Yes. So can I just ask, Absolutely. I know this has been bounced around to different places. <clears throat> and I know I've read it before. It's a little different now, but um, can it, can, can you explain to me how it started and, and maybe yeah. where it's been to this point? Yeah, so it started about a year ago, actually. Um, there was, if you'll remember, we had a number of um, kind of TIF credit enhancement agreement 101 sessions. It became really apparent from counselors at that time that there was going to be interest in having this policy. So staff started gathering up examples of policies. Um, and then um, when it was, when Council said, no, we really do want to start forming a policy. It was decided that that would start off in rules and policies. And so uh, Bill Donovan was chairing that committee, and it had on it as well Katie Foley and Paul Johnson. And so Bill and I met, and we took Portland's policy, free, uh, uh, Falmouth's or free Freeport, Freeport's, Freeport's and policy, and Mexico's <coughs> policy, uh, Mexico Maine. Mexico Maine? Um, they have a policy. For they have a policy for TIFs, and I thought it was I thought it was important to look at some of those smaller towns and see the kind of concerns that they were, you know, they were looking to address, and they had elements that Portland and Freeport did not have clearly. So the majority of the the real spine of the policy is Freeport's, but it has um, pieces of Portland's that felt really important, and I think there's one piece out of Mexico's. So that draft went. So Bill Donovan and I worked up that initial draft. And that draft is what went to Rules and Policies last spring. And Rules and Policies Committee members worked through that draft through a couple of meetings and got it to a point where they were comfortable with the language. And they voted to move it out to Finance Committee. The idea was that there was no crossover between the membership of Rules and Policies and Finance. And so that by the time it had gone through both committees, six out of seven councilors would have seen and workshopped the policy so that when it went to the town council for adoption, it would have been thoroughly vetted by the majority of council. We didn't get through the process as quickly as it had been intended, so we're in a different position now. But um, the Rules and Policies members voted unanimously that they were done with the policy, they were happy with where it stood, and they shifted it over to, to Finance. 
So, and, and I was going to say the only other thing I contributed, I think somewhere along the line you'd see some language in here. There is kind of a sense that maybe these types of things, because it's numbers and projections, maybe, and I think the language here got changed, that some of these things will come back to finance right. in the future. And that's, so. Those were that, suggested comments from finance committee members prior to the November meeting. So the finance committee that was in place prior to this finance committee was given the rules and policies draft in a Google Doc format yeah, yeah. and encouraged to make comments along the side of the draft and there were repeated comments about bringing the finance committee into part of the process. And so those changes have been adopted into the language of the draft. Um, and the large questions still to be answered are, um, is this really this question about public referendum? That's mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest questions to be answered. Um, and there was some discussion at the November meeting, and I left it in because there wasn't a consensus at that meeting, but there was discussion at the November meeting about whether or not um, because of the size of some TIF districts, because remember this is, this is, in this section we're talking about the establishment of a TIF district, not a credit enhancement agreement, okay, so that's a, these are separate items, um, that they, they can be very small, you know, that you could be looking to establish a TIF district, and is that something to put to public referendum? And so there was some back and forth conversation about that, but there wasn't any consensus. So staff didn't feel like we had the, we had direction about which way to incorporate that. Um, from a, from a um, economic development standpoint, staff recommends that we do not include public referendum in the process, just from a, if there's a public referendum piece, the, the, the delay that that would incur um, and the risk associated, it probably will make it very unlikely that anyone would seek to use this tool. And so there's not really a point in having a policy that is there to say, never mind, you're not welcome to use this tool. So that was one comment from staff. Um, but again, we didn't get direct. And was there a comment related to the TIF or the CEA? I mean, it's in the TIF section now, but there is a note, should we put this over on the CEA? That was one of the questions that one of the counselors on the Finance Committee broached was, would this be, do we want to push it, do we want to really push this public referendum conversation out of the establishment of a TIF district, because that really is a council function. Do we want to establish a TIF district that may or may not include a credit enhancement agreement? The, the TIF district is being formed for completely separate reasons. Yes, it allows for a credit enhancement agreement application to come forward at a later date, but the TIF district might be formed purely for public infrastructure purposes that the, the town council wants to, to use. So yes, there was one suggestion from a counselor, do we want to move that idea of public referendum to the credit enhancement agreement section? And but there's also the possibility for a TIF to be parcel specific. <coughs> you know, I don't have a good example here in Scarborough, but it's technically possible that you could TIF a property and it apply only to that property. There was some concern that uh, decisions would be kind of a popularity contest um, as opposed to made on the financial merits of the, the deal. And I think that was spurred <coughs> on somewhat by this suggestion of a public referendum that it could be really specific and really personal, um, potentially. I think Bessie is uh, a single <coughs> parcel that's a TIF district. That's in a good example. Area, so yes, thank you. And that's an affordable housing TIF, so it's a separate animal, but yes. Yeah, I, I don't know how deep you want to get into this. I guess with the referendum piece, um, bearing that in a policy, you're probably not going to follow your policy most of the time because uh, as a practical matter, you're not going to know enough details about whether you should send it to referendum, I think, for, for a TIF district, but probably for a CEA as well. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm not... I, to me, if you really want something to go to referendum, you put it in the charter and then... We don't really have a choice in the matter. <coughs> um, when it's in a policy that council adopts us, we have the option to not follow our policies. So I don't know that it has any meaning here other than maybe making it more complicated for staff to follow the, the, the typical economic development process. We're, you know, we're taking part in competitive bidding processes and whatnot. So, so maybe, <laughs> so maybe as a pause this evening, there. Are and I guess I'll defer to the community on what we want to, I just want to leave some time, I think, just getting to the, the budget metrics would be important this evening. So we can start, I'm not sure we're going to resolve the TIF conversation, but maybe what we should do with the TIF conversation. So 
given that, maybe we can reserve 10 minutes at the end to maybe get to the, the, the metrics for the budget yeah. at the very end and, and work whatever we can get through between now and then. Does that work? <coughs> well, I, uh, I guess I have another suggestion as well. I, I don't mind documenting the, because I, I feel like it's kind of working through minutiae in public. I, I can write something up for the input that I had. Um, but I, I think the next step for this would be to get some feedback from uh, SEDCO, maybe the Chamber of Commerce, maybe some developers. Uh, just I, I feel like this is heavily centered on uh, our perspective, and I'd like to understand how they would react to it or how they might view it differently. I, w I, I don't really feel the, the need for that. I definitely respect that, that idea. Um, to me, this is... This is a great document. I mean, and so I did reach out to Councillor Hamill and I said, hey, wow, how did this get developed? And it sounded like there was a lot of your work. I mean, the fact that you went through three different policies um, and uh, I, it did kind of lead me to a question. Does anyone have an ordinance on this or is it all policy that you found? I only found policy. Okay. But I did, the charter idea had, in terms of a CEA, had kind of struck me as well, is that we're coming up with charter. If people feel like for a certain level of CEA that they want to have input on that, then they would have to approve it through the charter process. I'm not saying I'm there yet, but I have to say the same exact thought had occurred to me. Um, and another thought was probably won't be popular, but why not? I'm not that popular, so I'll think <coughs> about is, um, you know, Instead of referendum, something has to be approved by five councillors, not just four. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you get more into a super majority situation. Um, so that you know, because you know, what struck me um, is, you know, I've been reading and rereading the Down CEA. I understand about fifteen percent of it now, maybe, and probably I'm wrong. Um, but I'm reading and reading and reading, and the town is just as encumbered, and I'm not saying that's bad or good, but as we are for bonds, you know. And so, you know, when we're bonding out, the town is making a major commitment, you know, for future spending, for future taxpayers, and we're really doing the same thing on a large CEA, you know, a small one, you know, I don't know. So t that's the other thought I've had in my mind, is there's some threshold that we're kind of looking for. And I think part of that flavor of the conversation you just described of the prior finance committee, that was the conversation that maybe the way you get at that, just like the charter has a threshold, that there's some type of threshold that triggers it or not. So um, so I, I guess we have a couple options. I think your option was maybe we pause and check in with the community. A couple of groups, yeah. Um, another option might be if there's just a couple of comments that you need further clarity on, can we get through those those this evening with sort of the consensus of this group? Then we have a working document that we can work from to share to get that public input and other stuff. So I don't know if that makes sense. <coughs> Maybe. Um, the only thing I do worry about is I know, you know, to wait till the charter gets down, that's probably going to be... 12, 18, 24 yeah. months No, out. I didn't want to wait. I wasn't putting that, it behind it. Yeah. That they're going to be other, there may be other CEAs or other things coming our way. This at least right. maps out a process it, by which yes. you can consider CEAs and there's an application process. I think there's some good attributes it, in the interim that may make some sense. Yeah, and I wasn't saying only do a charter option. I, I do think there's <coughs> some value to a policy. Yeah. I, but if you want to force referendum for a CA or a TIF, I think the charter's the right place to do it. It as could be parallel. To it in here. But I agree. I totally agree. I just want to say, what's our goal for getting this to council? Because it's been worked on a year. I think it would have helped us immensely with some of the things we're facing right now when I read it. Sure, I have a couple of small things that I would love to bring up, but when I read it, I was like, wow, this would have been such a huge help having this policy in place. And so I, I would just love to see it, you know, a few more maybe tweaks and then moved on to whatever we decide the next step is. So I have a question too. So we've, we've had this document for a while now. We have the CA that's in front of us today. This is part of my dilemma is 
<coughs> why didn't we use this as a guide, even though it wasn't adopted? Oh, that's a very it, good point. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think, for me, and I don't know the answer to that, but good, even though good. I was a counselor for some of it, um, but I think these are all unique. So it's hard to pinpoint which elements are going to be important for WEX versus the Downs versus Bessie Commons. It's hard to put that in a policy. That's why I want to socialize it a little broader um, to see if there's stuff that we're missing or that we're unintentionally closing the door on either opportunities or things that we could do uh, without being aware of that. And I do think the full council can kind of work through some of those yeah. concerns, you know, to get it back to them. Um, but, you know, there was a couple of places where I'm like, oh, we should make this more detailed, you know, and I thought, okay, no, nope. they tried to keep a very so. high level so that many doors stayed open, but there was a process in place. So, you know, a couple of times, the opposite of you, I was wanting to put, you know, some more um, framework and mm -hmm. around it, um, but then I could see the beauty of what was attempted, you know, in terms of we can't shut doors, but we also need a process to follow. Um, and that, to me, how could that not even be a win for the people who want to apply? Like, to say, well, this is what you would do. Um, you know, I'd, I'd probably make a, a couple of different changes. I think a, a CEA form application is different than a TIF. We put it on one form, I, you know. So, you know, there's a few things that I might, might put in, and I'm happy to put them all in writing. And, you know, I've just... Just, we're only meeting monthly, so if, if we don't do something to move it forward, it's not going to be out to council till March at best, and it's just already been worked on a year, and I think it's a great policy, you know, so. The so major maybe. sticking points really are that public referendum piece. That, that's, a, that's a major policy piece that um, really changes the tone of the policy dramatically, wh whether it's in or whether it's out. Yeah. Um, or which section it's in. But yes, but I would say totally. In either section, it's going to have a significant impact, whether it's there or whether it's not there, on how the policy is used. But certainly, yes, deciding if you're going to have public referendum piece in there, having it in the just establishing the TIF district has a has a greater impact, perhaps, than having it in the CEA section. And I would say that <coughs> it's possible that this committee could potentially decide to put it in, but then, you know, kind of with the footnote that to workshop that or discuss that with the council at large and it could be removed or I guess it could be the opposite. We could remove it and they could put it back in. So I don't think it's a done deal what this committee would say on that. I think that would be ultimately voted on by the full council. I, so if I could, and I know Peter you want to move past this, but I, uh, from a matter of process I think it's I would not recommend you send something that has open questions. Uh, to the oh, council, the council as a body, that there should be a concrete document that they review, yeah. they can adopt because it makes sense, it works. Uh, they may members may disagree, but I, our process does not lend itself well to to be drafting by committee. Certainly, in but the workshops context. definitely help. I mean, so well, I would say if we take it out, which is your recommendation, or leave it in, whichever one, we finalize it. I would imagine it would come up at a workshop conversation again, which is fine, yeah. and that's fine, and we could we can kind of discuss uh, I, whether or not. I have workshops in my mind for the next six weeks, I know. Yeah, six uh, meetings. So can I, I ask you a question on a major policy like this? Um, and you guys, is, do you typically see the council go through and approve one section at a time? And so we go through, um, you know, we we start with <coughs> smaller sections. On the agenda, and then and then move through them one section at a time. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think usually I think to kind of piggyback on what Tom said for a policy for a document like this, um, they'll probably be presented in its entirety. The thought would be that you know if it has come through committees, that much like we just did with the marijuana policy, then the council members when it comes forward, they may want to workshop to work through some of it. But when it hits the floor, that again, they'll bring forth motions that they would like to consider for change. But we'd probably mm -hmm. do it all in one, one piece. I mean, we could certainly change that. It, it's worth thinking about because yeah. just thinking about the marijuana, you know, like um, looking at how some of the other towns tackled that. They did go one section at a time. Some of these yeah. things are, are pretty pretty complex. Um, so I mean, I I don't want to introduce a whole new process. Uh, at this point, you know, to get through this policy, but it's, it's something worth thinking about because, yeah. you know, 
I mean, for all we know, someone could have, you know, major major problems with it. Although, like you said, several people have already worked on this, <laughs> you know, so it's pretty much down to Ken and me. And were you involved in any of the? I was not. Although I, I read it. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, the problem becomes we've got whole new players too. But anyway. Right. This evening, do you want to just? Larissa, you want to just kind of lead us through where you think the contention points are yeah, and see if I, and this think, group can come to yep. some and so consensus? The first, one, the first one is that public referendum. Yep. I will say um, I feel confident that if SEDCO were here, they would ask you to consider removing that. Yep, I hear you. So um, the next point of kind of where we need some input from you guys is um, in, oh, let's see which page I'm on. I'm on page 8. We touch screen, yes, we are. So what so section is that? I'm in Mind section four, number. level of municipal participation. Right. All the, all the we, our drafts. What so I didn't have. actually have the most of the questions that you're Seven. looking at in my draft? I'm sorry. So, so I'm in you? section four, right above section five, actually. So um, in the bullet immediately preceding section five, application process for credit enhancement agreements. There's a bullet that says where yep. state law would limit the town's ability to form a new TIF district Priority shall be given to, one, established businesses that are expanding a facility, two, businesses where the land and buildings are owned by the applicant, three, leased commercial entities. And that's some, that's some new language. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not at the right <coughs> place. It's just above five. Okay, yep, I see five. Right okay. Okay, five, so five, what this is, and this is a bullet point that we really don't need to belabor because it's never actually going to happen. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the completely mythological scenario in which the town has just about hit its threshold, according to the state, for acreage in a TIF district yeah. and or value in a TIF district. Right. And we happen to have two competing applications in front of council. Right. And council needs to decide the limited acreage or the limited value they have left, which I want to just repeat because of the size of Scarborough and the value of Scarborough is never, ever going to happen. Which, how do you decide which application to, to favor over the other? And so this is saying council is in that scenario that will never happen. You're going to first give preference to um, a, an established business that's looking to expand an existing facility, that that would be the TIF district that you would prioritize. Well, what happens if they both are that? Then you're going to say, all right, well, is there a business where the land and buildings are owned by the applicant as opposed to a leased building? And then finally and thirdly, that would go to a leased commercial entity. So um, it's... That's the suggestion of staff, that that be the, the, the priority. But I really just want to, again, it's oh, never it's not, actually it, going to happen. It's not either or. It's these are the three criteria. These are the three criteria that you're going. Right. So the first one okay, is to gotcha. it, make sure it's a business that's expanding an existing facility. <clears throat> so if it's never going to happen, why do we have it? Because policy? it could, right? I mean, okay. it, this is a policy. It's a high-level helping to guide direction policy. And on the off chance that somehow we find ourselves in the situation it's best to have a map. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Okay, so that language is okay with well, everyone? So so you want one, two, and three? Yes. Right? In that order. Is that what they're asking? Yep, looks good. Okay, I'm going to hit resolve, and it's just going to adopt that language. Okay. Do you want to go back to the pub? You're, you're, moving, through, <clears throat> you're moving us through it? Good, okay, okay. what's next? Um, next, we're, just gonna, we're gonna keep ignoring referendum for right now. We're gonna go to the easy pieces yes, first. Yeah, yeah. So number five, right underneath that, um, Peter, uh, in November, had suggested, I'm sorry, Councillor Hayes had suggested in November that um, perhaps the Finance Committee should be part of the coordination of activities. Um, so that needs to have further conversation. I think that from a staff perspective, this feels very, the, where we are in this particular section, feels very administrative, and that it would, it feels, I think, cleanest and, and best to have the background prep work be done by SEDCO and the executive department. And then there are further places in this policy where then the finance committee has been put into the process for the review piece, but not for the preparation piece. Which I have some comments on that, but I don't have any issues with this language here. With, with the language as it exists or with the addition of finance committee? Um, the language as it exists. As it exists. I, I wouldn't answer. So I'm, I guess I'll, I'll share my general comment. Um, the Finance Committee is a, a subcommittee of the council, right? So yeah. it, if the chair of finance doesn't want a TIF or CEA to happen, he can just not put it on the agenda. And I think that's not 
Well, that, practically a good way. It should go to, to me. If you're referring it to finance, you should go through the council, <coughs> and then it should be referred to finance first. I, I, it should go to the council <coughs> first and then refer it to finance, so that it has to be taken up. Otherwise, I, I feel like it's creating a situation where um, there's undue influence by a, a few councilors as opposed to the council of, in total. So let me. So part of the thought I. Th think on this, I mean, and I think to your first point, I think, I think we heard though that even if, the, even if a chair of a committee doesn't want to put something on the agenda, mm -hmm. if it's asked for by the other participants, I mean, <coughs> we have had a policy that it goes on the agenda. But, or, but, yeah, sure. But, <coughs> but I think, and maybe there's another solution, I think the thought of this was sometimes the town council itself is not looped in on the front end. So if there are any concerns, there's a vehicle or a way to channel the conversations. Because I think, and I don't know what the right solution is, um, and, and maybe, maybe we can substitute this by being the executive leadership of the town council. But I think a couple times things have gotten down the pike aways before town council members are actually brought in or were aware. And this was just trying to create some mechanism by which, and, and maybe it's not the finance committee, I mean, it's either a committee structure or the executive leadership team, I don't know what other sort of vehicle, but that, that was the thought. So I don't know if there's a solution or a concern, not a concern. <coughs> yeah, it, it's a tough one because we're moving parts, right? So we're, in my view, what you want your policy to be is something that exists without us. We're giving direction on staff for, for how things can work, and you don't have to involve the council. Um, and it sounds like we're instead writing a policy that integrates the staff and the council. Right, which I think we want to do. That's where the, well, it's our policy. I, I, I disagree. I, I, I think the intent of the policy is to give direction for how staff can <laughs> operate independent of us. and. Where the gaps are is where we need to coordinate. But, it, but I think what we're trying to say that is a gap. That <coughs> I mean, we can use several examples where it feels like, at times, staff is out in front of yeah. the town council. And I agree. And, I, and, and, yeah. and what we're trying to do is to say it should be integrated. It shouldn't be a time where staff gets out in front of town council. It should be a combined collaborative, yeah, this is a good idea, or it's a great idea, but we have these concerns. I mean, I'm, and when we talked about this, it was certainly, where does that belong? I mean, I'm comfortable if, it, if it's the executive leadership, whether it's the chair or vice chair, sort of just get, it doesn't have to be real elaborate, but it's just kind of a check-in. Hey, does this make sense? So, and, and I share some of those concerns. So where are the, the right touch points, right? So yeah, we yeah. all know yeah. what's going on, and then... Uh, and so the public knows what's going on as exactly. well. Exactly. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not clear that the finance committee is the right place to put that, and I don't have another suggestion today, but I'll think about it. Okay. Can we talk maybe? about the, the steps? So I, okay. I, so I think that some of this conversation happened at the previous meeting, and I think some of the concern was addressed. So if we want to look at the steps that we're talking about here, and if we think about it, I mean, this is for credit enhancement agreements, but I guess I would encourage us to think about other places that public members of the public apply for uh, apply for things from the town and w that involve council eventually. So we might think of special amusement permits um, uh, or other boards, like when people are applying for a zoning variance, they're gonna go in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And at what point does staff work with them to prep that application and then get it in front of the deciding body? Okay, so I think if we think about, so this is saying that step one, somebody from the public comes and says, how do I go about even thinking about a credit enhancement agreement? Step one says, said co-staff will provide information on Scarborough's tax increment financing program to the applicants. That that's, that's said co's job. Because kind of to Councillor Gleistein's point, part of this document should be seen as beneficial to potential developers so that they understand the process and are guided through what they should be doing. So now they know, I need to go to said co first. This isn't something I go talk to a counselor about. I go to said co to start this process. Then said co says, Town manager, look, I've got a, 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 somebody who's kind of interested in this. Before we go any further with this, let's have a meeting and talk about whether this is even viable. Um, and the town manager 
has the, the policy says after, if they wish to, reaching out to these different groups, the town manager has the authority to say, all right, you're welcome to apply. You're welcome to use staff time to kind of move forward with this. The third one is that the applicant files a preliminary application with the town through SEDCO. SEDCO reviews the application for completeness and then submits it to the town manager. As soon as that happens, it triggers the town manager in consultation with the town council chair to schedule a joint workshop between the town council and the SEDCO board of directors. And the workshop um, results in feedback, and we're pretty clear about what that feedback is. And then once that has happened, then the applicant now is on them again in step five. They've gotten the feedback, and they, have, they get to decide at that point if they wish to submit a final application for approval, which is a separate step from the preliminary process that's happened. Um, and if they do, <coughs> um, then we move on to step six. And that's where the Finance Committee was added in last time that we met in November. So that was one of the places that the Finance Committee was brought into this process. Um, so the, there's a presentation of the analysis of the factors I've identified in section five, uh, four. Um, and that presentation is given to the Finance Committee for review edit, and we're asking you to consider instead of approval before recommending to the town council, review, edit, and recommendations to the town council so that an application can't die in the finance committee, that, but that the finance committee has the authority to give a, a recommendation to council, mm -hmm. which we would assume would have some good weight. Um, so the finance committee is, is an integral part of the process there. And then step seven is that it is brought to the council for approval using a full public process, including a first reading, public hearing, and second reading. So that's, that's where the Finance Committee was added in during the November discussion, was in that, was decided that it was appropriate oh, in that step. We had it in two places. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think yeah. that the discussion tonight is just at that November meeting, there wasn't a final yes or no gotcha. about if the Finance Committee should also be included in that coordination of activities. Gotcha. And and then you also clarified that it wouldn't die in finance. Right. That's, that's could, the other They'd question. have the opportunity to make a recommendation. Right. I mean, it was, never, it, was, right. it, was ne it was never the intent to kill it. It yeah. was just to have an extra set of eyes. Some pre-work. So pre -work, yeah. I think that's I'm up. hearing that at least two of you would be comfortable with us changing the words approval mm -hmm. before recommending to the word recommendation. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, well, yep. that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yep. that's so good. Think, All right, I'm going to make that change now then. <laughs> you're just, you're I'm just, just leap work. Get it on. <laughs> it's like she's on a mission. I'm efficient. Like, no, that's it, good. And I'm just, I'm wondering in any of the steps, <coughs> if we have things we might want to bring up, what would be the right time <coughs> to do that? Because we're going through Larissa's questions now. Should I bring up a question or wait on that? Um, I I was, I'm happy to wait. Though, yeah, I, I'd suggest maybe trying to get through what her burning okay. yep. issues. Okay. And then, because like I've got some other things it's, too. And Don, I'm going to look okay. for body yep. language because I knew I like you've been that. Yeah, we're trying. We're stuff. trying to read the. <laughs> we're trying to read, yeah. So, can I just bring us back to the beginning of section five um, about what, where did you guys land as far as who gets to be, who should be part of the initial pre workshop process? <coughs> can that be a staff function only, prepping that? and then knowing that the Finance Committee is going to have full review before it goes to Town Council in order to make a recommendation. Is that comfortable, and therefore can we just leave the language SEDCO and the Executive Department will coordinate all activities regarding applications? I am comfortable with that. I am. I'm comfortable okay. What was it before? That is what it is now. Peter, uh, Councillor Hayes. Oh, that's where we had had the Finance Committee in there twice. Right. No, I'm comfortable with this. Okay, yeah. I'm resolving that issue then. Okay. Don, do you want to? Do you want to? Is your comment about this section? Uh, yeah, <coughs> I, I'd rather have you blow through what you're doing and just make a comment at the end if I could. Yeah. I don't want to cut into your other time. Okay, step eight, and this is a, I think, a fairly um, important point. So during implementation, the designated departments will monitor ongoing public and private investments in the particular development project to ensure their compliance with findings of fact and the policies contained herein. So staff is suggesting um, that we have some clarification about what the intent of this step is. Staff interprets this to mean compliance with the credit enhancement agreement. So it's suggesting changing the words findings of fact for credit enhancement agreement 
instead so that it's very clear what staff is monitoring. We don't know what finding, findings of fact mean. Right, that's a <coughs> defined term for like planning or something like that, but it does, as it relates to a CA, it's not really clear. Right. Well, is it, this is a terrible thing to say. <laughs> it's, I mean, how we monitor, I think we already started talking about that. That's, that's perhaps a different policy. I mean, this is a policy I thought to apply, to right, it. to establish it. I'm just, I, I don't have a problem with leaving it in, but it's, it's a non sequitur to me in a way, right, because Take this is up. how do you apply, and then all at once we're like, well, once we're implementing, you need to monitor this. It feels like, Tom, you kind of said, we're already going to be working <coughs> on how do we monitor these things, right? So, I, I, so maybe a step at the end of the steps is that, you know, the, the town council will approve a monitor, since they're unique, to your point, will approve a monitoring plan. You know, so a monitoring plan will be developed no. and the town council will approve it. Um, I mean, you have a professional yeah. staff that uh, you, you should hold accountable for doing their jobs. If I, I think it's part of my job to make sure everything <coughs> we do is compliant with council action. So I, right. I don't think this step is even needed in my view. But. Were you there in the original draft? This yeah, isn't our. This, is, this wasn't. This finance. is honestly. I think that this is a missed piece from the first original work document, right? Because so, we didn't talk about. Right. This, this was not addition. Yeah. No one in finance committee suggested the words "finding a fact." It's just that, and this happens when we work, to work on ordinances okay. all the time too. As you go through the document again and again, uh, small pieces keep yeah. popping out at you, and this is one of those catches that we were going through, and, and Karen said, "Whoa." What, where is the findings of fact? We're supposed to be monitoring the credit enhancement agreement and the, the pieces of that agreement. Let's make sure that that's clear here. I mean, I mean, the only thing I can think of, which I think is what Betsy's talking about, is findings of facts is saying when the CEA start, there's a set of facts saying this is what mm. we assume is going to happen. And it's findings oh. of fact, meaning going back and saying, <coughs> okay, checking in to say, did these things we assume happen? I don't know if that was the intent. I don't think so. And there's not, I don't believe there's another space in which we call for findings of fact. Yep. So I think this really was just, and I'll own this, this was poor drafting on my part, right? So this this is probably language that was part of Portland or Freeports that got kind of tucked in kind without tucked in. careful yeah. thought. I'm comfortable removing it as well. To me, those monitoring mechanisms will either be defined in the CEA through financial agreements or other criteria that are looking at. But I think that's the right place for it to be, because each one's a little bit unique. So removing step eight entirely? Well, I am okay with that. We're not going through new things now, but I did, you know, was interested in a step related to financial analysis. So to get to your point of what you were saying, yeah. you know, like what is this starting point that we assumed that we were going to get? What did we all, you know, say, hey, this is why we're doing it, um, to make sure that we all are in agreement with that, and then we can monitor against that. Um, so to me, there was a, a piece of a financial analysis somewhere in the steps, and so I was going to suggest that, but um, I'm okay to remove this because I'm not sure this gets at that. Okay. Is that consensus? Yes. Okay. Yep. For removing that, and I'm thinking through the financial piece, that does need to happen somewhere. So. Yep. Right. Somebody needs to analyze it. Yeah, like before so, the workshop, yeah. I think. But anyway, we can yep. get yeah, so there. Yeah, so we'll make a note to come back to that. Okay. Yep. Um, and then another, um, it references a non-refundable application fee. Yep. And, and it says, as referenced in the schedule of fees published annually, um, staff is recommending that initially we start at $250. So I thought this should be either higher or a retainer to so reflect our actual costs. That there's the, two pieces. So yeah. the, the initial, so the process calls for both a non-refundable application fee, as well as if you look at the next bullet down, at the time of final application submission. So that's the, they've had the workshop and they've decided the developer back in section four, step five, the developer has said, yep, 
I've, I've gone to the workshop, I've heard all of your concerns, I still want to go, in, to go forward and I'm going to do that final application. The second bullet says, all right, if they make that decision to do that final application, they're going to give us a deposit of $1,500 to be put in this kind of reserve. And there is some further comment that Councillor Hayes says, that's not enough money. <laughs> it needs to be more money than that to be set right. aside. Uh, so these are two separate fees. Yeah, and I think the conversation at night, though, is that even just that application process, it's by the time right. staff touches it, researches it, <coughs> to 1500 I mean, I think of when Tom talks about the legal fees that have been incurred, um, you know, 250 is like half hour of an attorney's time. I mean, it's not a whole lot. I mean, I mean, what's the rationale for 250 instead of 1500 You think it's a barrier? I think that what we were hearing from um, our economic development director is that they didn't really love having an application fee, period, um, but understood why there was going to be political will for having that application fee. And by having this kind of tiered system where that 250 gets you in the door to work with SEDCO to get that preliminary application prepared and that workshop held, that that is kind of weeding out people that really aren't at all serious. But there shouldn't be any true there shouldn't be any large cost to the town until after that workshop has been held, that joint workshop between council and SEDCO. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So I, I'm a little conflict, conflicted on this one. So I, we're going to charge ten grand for somebody who wants to grow marijuana in, in a, right. a factory, um, and then only two fifty <coughs> for somebody to work with their economic development. So I, 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 that's a little bit strange to me. But on the other hand, uh, we want to encourage businesses to approach SEDCO for opportunities that might benefit the town. And I don't want some unnecessary formality to detract from that, ha that from happening. I understand the deterrent aspect, but how many of these requests do we really get? Uh, does anybody know? I, I, it's one a year? Not even. OK. Well, but, <coughs> but with Scarborough Downs, we may be getting, I mean, there's a whole bunch there of. There could be more. There could be. A lot more. You think so? I would. If, if I was going to go to Scarborough Downs based on the headlines, I would go through the process of applying for a CEA. Why wouldn't you? Interesting. Well, I would maybe suggest that, you know, certainly you can meet in step one with SEDCO with no application fee and discuss that. But if we if you want to go to step two, if you want the town manager to meet, review the viability, and get all the departments involved and all that, at that point, um, we put a retainer on, and uh, they, they, get, they will be charged for all of the expenses for the entire application process. And we come up with some kind of a retainer, I mean. Including um, staff time? I would say some staff time, yeah. We come up with a number, but you know, that. We're not trying to make money off of this. I, I'm not, I, you know, I just want it to be a break even to get somebody through the process. Um, and you need a retainer to, you know, at least get in the door. Um, but maybe it'd be more tenable to say it's a retainer. <coughs> but certainly, I think people are going to have conversations with SEDCO without, like, paying 250 bucks. So They should. Right. Yeah. So I would say, you know, if you want to go to step two, once you've had this conversation with, with SEDCO, then we... Then we have some kind of application fee or some kind of retainer, and then we, you know, we determine how to uh, say what those costs are. Um, and you know, once once you're <coughs> you're going through that process, you could back out at any time, and your expenses, you know, would not be that great. It's funny, you know, I, you changed my thinking a little bit, Peter. I I was of the mind that who's going to apply for this if we're going through this process with Wax? Who's the next guy that's going to come in the downs and apply? And this actually might invite it. So we, we, because I don't think we'd see a clear benefit right now. Where if somebody came to Seco or, or Tom, I think it'd have to be a pretty big deal for them to go through the process. Where this removes that discretion and says, if you follow, if you check these boxes, then you can apply. And it, you can get it through to the council without that discretion. And that's, I guess that's okay, but I guess it, it, in that mind, interesting thought. Uh, <laughs> You might want to hire a fee. If, if you're inviting <coughs> more people to apply for CEAs, then you will want some kind of barrier. Well, is, is that your purpose with this, to invite more to apply? No, no. I, I, think, I, think, I think the purpose of this was just, I mean, I just look at the amount of time 
all of us collectively have spent on the WEC CA. I mean, you think about the council time that's been taken, you think about the legal fees we've incurred, you think of the staff time. These aren't, there's resources invested, and I think all, you know, just to protect, I mean, I think, you know, people have read the headlines. If, if I was going to, and I think any businesses going into the Scarborough Downs District would probably, I mean, I think it'd be just good business. I mean, look at some of the other impact fees that we charge that aren't barriers to entry. I mean, I still remember none such brewery saying they they paid fifty or sixty thousand dollars in impact fees to start a business. So I mean, I think it's a cost. Of, so I think we want to have a threshold so the serious folks come forward, but you, you, we don't deal with those that are saying I'm just going to apply and see what happens, and we invest resources and time. So it's not a money maker. It's really designed to be, so I don't know, I mean, I think in it, the way it's bulleted here, the way it was drafted, it says a, a non-refundable application fee, but we didn't say what it was, and then with the final application, there's a deposit of 1500 right? So Right, and so the, the first one comes in at step three in that section five, the applicant shall file a preliminary application with the town through SEDCO. And so that initial, that non-refundable application fee would be due at that time. Right. So to Councilor Glassine's point, yeah, they can talk to SEDCO. Free. For free. Yeah. But if they're going to file a preliminary application, that yeah. that's what triggers that joint workshop, then they have a non-refundable application fee. And, um, and Karen Martin's suggestion there was, let's make that nominal so that it's not free to do, but you're not discouraging the process. And so I think that that's just a, a question for you guys to decide. Where is that line where it really does make sure that people are not just willy-nilly applying for the credit enhancement just in case. They actually want to be invested in the process, but that it's not so high as to um, be prohibited. So can Karen say no? Or uh, Tom can say no, right? So after... If you look at the end of step two, <coughs> yeah. you're giving me the authority to invite the application. Uh, me or whoever sits in my chair, I presume, is not going to let something pass them that doesn't make financial sense to the town. So fine. Yeah, I, I, there's I just a lot of time. I don't know. In step two, I think, what, was where my concern was. Fee? It says we'd right, be. But what, I guess what, what's the fee amount that you're comfortable with? For the initial application? Yeah. Um, I, I kind of think the fee should be bound after the, if the town manager invites. Um, the application, I guess that should be the trigger, and in that case, I'd be okay with a higher fee, because that's a pretty good threshold to get through. And that is, the policy does say at the time of final submission to the town is outlined in step three of section five. So so for me, that's okay. that's too far, because step two, you're already saying you're going to talk to the town attorney, the code enforcement, public works. I can't. You know. It doesn't say I will. It says I right, can't. You can't. Right. So I'm just saying, to me, step two is, is a pretty big step. Step one... You know, you could definitely do that, but, you know, you should be able to find out enough in step one to know if you want to put a retainer forward and go to go through the go through the process. Anybody comfortable with just saying on that instead of 250, it's 500, and then we get further comment from fun. <coughs> it's 500 at step three. Yeah, the non-refundable allocation to go from two to three. Right? Yes. Oh uh, no. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not really I mean, comfortable with that. Two to three. What's two? Am I missing one? The one. I think we're saying submit a non-refundable application fee. That. That's bullet three on this. That's yeah. bullet. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. To, yeah. to, to do step three, they need to pay the fee. Yeah. But they, they can't get to step three unless they get through <coughs> the town manager. Well, and a lot of other people. That's, that's kind of where I have my... At the manager's discretion, yeah. Right. So if, it's, if it helps, maybe it doesn't help you, but I, I control the workflow of my staff. You're not telling me how I should be using my staff's time. Oh, no, I'm just trying to figure out if we want to get revenue. I mean, not revenue from it, but offset yeah. cost. I, I guess I just look for you to have confidence that who's ever sitting in my seat is using their staff uh, wisely and uh, appropriately. Well, it just looks to me like there would be an awful lot of work potentially in step two, including talking to the town attorney, um, 
So I, I just don't know why the applicant shouldn't bear some of that expense. I guess that's my, you know. I, I'm fine with it coming in at step three. I, I, I think most of these, if they're frivolous, Tom's going to just ward off by looking at it. He's not going to have to involve a lot of people. And that allows that to happen. Um, if you have them charge a fee before that happens, then there's an expectation that they're going to get that due process through with more more staff being involved, I think. So I guess I'm, I am really confused in what, so are we, we're, John, which one, so we've got, on, I'm on this page that has three bullets. Yeah. Step three, you're defining as application will be provided. No, I think no, we're I, looking we're on the, we're at on the top steps. Oh, what, oh, referring to referring, the steps. Referring back. Oh, you're, you're, okay. Yeah, I'm we're trying, referring back. I'm trying back. to get back. Okay, so. Yeah. yeah I, so, and in my world, it doesn't, so you know, is, if you don't do it, it doesn't, you, you know, you're, yeah. it's just so a retainer. So you, comes into play you get the deposit get back. So between yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm good with that. Okay. Yeah. But that, what Betsy's saying is she wants the fee to come here. She wants a retainer, not a fee. Yeah, the retainer, because there's a lot of work in here. They're you know, potentially, you know, talk of the town. So attorney, our retainer this would is be where it's being worked. You've to given get us $1,500 us. that we're putting in a separate account for you, and we're only gonna, we're going to use your money for any legal fees that we need to have and so forth. If we don't need it, then you get that money back. Is that the only time you can use that money is for legal fees, or can you use it for an allocation? I think that that's where things get tricky, Councillor Questing, is that. Um, the staff time, we certainly aren't going to pay staff out of that account. Yeah, I would certainly be comfortable with it just saying legal and any any um, contract fees, like con if you had to have a contract planner or somebody like that involved. I would certainly be comfortable with that since those are like anything that we would get an invoice for. Um, I would be comfortable with staying the retainers for that, not the staff time. I think that there's um, also, though, to just if I may, I think there's a little possibility of a town manager looking to go to a whole lot. I mean, this is a preliminary application to decide if it's even going to get workshopped by. So there shouldn't be a lot of um, independent contractors needed to ass assess. Well, that's it. fine. Then the retainer would be returned. So that's that's kind of where it, where I'm at is that if there are if there do end up being a lot of fees in step two, or at least where we get invoices, not staff time. But if there ends up being a lot of fees, then there would be a retainer there that we would draw on, and the applicant would agree to pay for those fees that we encounter. I just don't see why we should incur any costs for their application, but I don't think they should overpay either. Just pay the fees. And then I wouldn't do the 1500 I guess. I would just say it's a retainer fee to go through the whole thing. So your suggestion would be just charge at step two a fifteen hundred retainer out of the <coughs> legal fees, and then when it, if it did go to step three, then that's where the application fee would be deducted. I wouldn't even do an application fee. All I'm trying to do is make sure we don't incur additional costs, but it would be a retainer fee for legal and any other contract work that we have done. I don't done. think you can charge a fee until they apply. So the step two is SEDCO and the town manager will meet to review the viability of any potential application. I don't see how you can charge them a fee on the potential of them it's applying. It's not a fee. It's a retainer. I don't see how you can charge a retainer on the potential of them applying. Maybe, I, I mean, maybe you can. Well, I've, yeah, I've had some dealings with other towns that, that do that. They require a retainer even for you to put a to site, talk plan, to somebody. site plan review in. Yeah. Well, site plan review is a bigger deal, I think. Um, this, all I'm envisioning here is a conversation between SEDCO and the town manager about a possibility. And, and that's, that's fine. I mean, in <coughs> step one, SEDCO talks to them, if Tom ta or the town manager talks to them too, that's, that's fine too. I'm just talking about when you start getting pretty involved in getting all of, of these other departments and outside uh, invoices that could come to us. So I'd be okay with striking the second sentence where it says where appropriate the executive department will reach out to obtain preliminary input from town department <coughs> but then keeping the town manager shall fa fa have final authority to invite an application. Strike what? I, I, I would be okay with striking where appropriate the executive department will reach out to obtain preliminary input from town departments, uh, tax assessor, town attorney, codes and Enforcement officer, director of public works, director of public safety, and advise the applicants on the findings of town staff. So that would push it until the applicant, 
that work until the application process. Unless Tom sees a dire need to talk, so he's going to talk to his staff if yeah, he has a question. Talk to it anyway. yeah. Yeah. So you just strike all that. The town manager shall have the final authority to invite. Step three is the applicant, and this is the now we're back to the non refundable yeah. application fee, yeah. which it sounded like you're okay with at some level. <coughs> yeah, at, at that point, I'm okay with a decent threshold because. Okay. So what's. And I'm fine with just a retainer that can be returned if at any point. I'm not, I'm okay with them not paying a fee, a non-refundable fee. I worry about the, uh, whether you're going to have, you're going to actually spend more staff time trying to reconcile the retainer and you know, draw up receipts. Maybe yeah. you're not, but uh, I'd be okay with the fee. With, with just at that point, whether you make it through the process or not, you've got to pay something to, to start. I'm really concerned about the law of unintended consequences, yeah. and maybe, maybe they are intended, and I'm misinterpreting it. But I just know that every day I have conversations that some of them are a germ of an idea that end up, uh, you know, materializing into something totally different. But without the kind of time and conversation, um, I just don't want to do anything that's going to throw cold water in a good idea but that might need work. Yeah, and I think they just widen what you could do. Step two gives you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I my comment is kind it. of policy wide. Uh, I think that's the danger of having this policy is that we are. All I'm saying is I think the applicant should bear the expense. I'm not. You know, excuse not, me, Council, I'm not even yeah. talking about. Uh, my, my comment is probably out of order. It's more generally about the effect a policy will have that we can't Im imagine necessarily the chilling effect it might have. So, like, what would you say that, I mean, if you had to take a wild guess, what do we spend on attorney fees for the current deal in front of us? I'm not speaking to that. I, I, if I had to guess, $4,000? So in this case, it's maxed at 1500 and 250 Counselor, Is yeah, that right? I, I beg your pardon. I was perhaps inappropriately uh, commenting about the whole conversation about the policy. I think it's well intentioned, but I just fear the um, law of unintended consequences. The whole policy, yeah. Well, I mean, you don't think we should have a policy? I personally that? don't. No, I've not advocated oh, for this whatsoever. I gotcha. okay. it, it, and I'm and not I, too I'm far not, off of that because it's pretty heavily regulated by the state. Well, and I'm not and it's controlled by elected officials. So, uh, that to me, that's the beauty of it is that you have reasonable people that aren't necessarily experts that have to make the decision to approve something like this. When you and putting it into a policy is kind of taking that discretion away to some extent. It's making yeah, it, if you check these boxes, you, you can get a, a CEA from Scarborough. No, you can get a vote. Extent. Yeah. Well, right. Um, so all I'm saying is these fees wouldn't even cover the expenses we're talking about with this current CEA. Well, I know. So that's why I'm just, and I'm not trying to get more money out of people. I just want them to cover the expenses. That's my, that's my thing. Um. <coughs> So I'm struggling with it. We're, we're at 7.30, <laughs> and I'm not sure um, where this conversation just went um, puts us in a whole different space. I mean, I think the problem becomes, you know, I, I think Larissa did a great job at the beginning saying this started with ordinance. Ordinance thought it made sense to have a policy. This is an attempt to get at that policy. It's now been through finance. I guess we can go back up and entertain that, that conversation about should we have a policy at all? Yeah, I wasn't I trying to go back I think you're past that. I, I, I inadvertently that. offered an editorial <coughs> comment that probably was out of order. So So That's valuable. So let me I mean the only so the only place I am with a policy is what I do get concerned about when we are talking about the magnitude. I mean this is the largest TIF in the state, right? What? It's covered out. In jet, the one, the one <coughs> I don't know. Or it's large. It's big. And it's big. Iron it's works big. might be bigger, but yeah. it's large. It's big. And there's potential for a lot more businesses that may be interested in this. If, if I was going to go into Scarborough Downs, it'd be one of the first things I would do. Sure. So one of the things I am concerned about in this really litigious society that I think we should have something in place that we at least have some criteria and a guidepost to say why we said yes or no as these come down the pike. And I don't know if that's valuable or not, but I do worry about someone <coughs> claiming that the process wasn't fair. So I don't know if that's... Mm -hmm. So I guess at this point, I'd entertain 
we're not going to finish this tonight. Um, so our options would be, I think it's important that we, at least as a finance committee, recommend whether we, what we want to do. I don't know if both of you are open to maybe trying to do this, just have this as a single item we can work on sometime soon. For a meeting? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think with the, the changes that we made today, if you can, because I didn't get this until, I, I forget, I, when the, it was published, like Monday or something. So I haven't dug deep into it. I yeah, read it okay. and I made some comments. But yeah. if maybe you can share it with the group mm -hmm. and then we can <coughs> digest it. Digest it, yeah. And, uh, uh, and then maybe that, you know, drafting some proposed edits. A lot of my changes weren't, again, I don't know if I'm, in support of the policy in general, but I'm, I'm trying to help it move through the process in mm -hmm. a way that I would at least yeah, be comfortable yeah. with the wording. Um, and a lot of my changes were minor. It was yeah. changing like a 20% to a 10% and, and things like that. Yeah, I, <coughs> I mean, I think it's close. I think it's, it's closer close, than it so sounds. I think. I think it's a lot closer than it sounds. So maybe if we could schedule us getting together sometime in the next week or so, I don't know what everybody's schedule is, or two weeks. <laughs> Yeah, is, no. is next week the marathon week with the, no. But we have a council meeting on Wednesday next week, mm -hmm. so that's not bad. And so maybe we, let's, if that's agreeable, we'll work with staff to try to find out a time sure. that might work. Mm -hmm. So it'll be single item to push through this? Yeah, yep. to get through it. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll share it out that incorporates the comments that we've heard tonight. So it should be down to two or three items, yep. frankly. Okay. And it might be a fairly quick meeting if you're able to do some pre-work. Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm going to suggest. I, I, right. I, I'll send you my... Suggestions yeah, before all. the meeting, and then we can review them and see. That makes and and Don, can you send us your? Do you, do you want to weigh on in your comments at this point? If uh, not, send us the. No, the only thing <coughs> I can say is. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Just so, nice. uh, yeah, I'm uh, just going to say two things. One is uh, the idea of a tip CDA policy came up when we were doing the Scarborough Down CDA, you know, a year and a half. Or so yeah. ago. Yeah. So people then were asking, well, do we have a policy? Will we have one someday, Virginia? Is there a Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the need for a policy is pretty clear. So discussion about just, you know, tossing the whole thing doesn't make any sense at all in terms of the work I think that has been up to done up to this point. Mm -hmm. The desire to put it in front of this committee, the new committee, was to try to get your input on it and to help us, you know, review it and to see if it's ready then to go to council for the council to discuss further. So, you know, I, that's a, an appeal for moving forward. We ran out of time. Basically, the buzzer went off. We didn't have a chance to get this from from rules and policies to finance to the council. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a similar issue with the other agenda item around uh, the joint resolution. Yeah. You know, a fair amount of work. I'd just suggest we try to follow through on the body of work and then make a decision. And if we decide we don't want it at all, that's fine. Now, one final point. If we had something like this in place, it would facilitate our educating the public about CEAs and how we handle them. And if we get one in the future, how would it be handled? At no time was this ever conceived of as an advertisement for CEAs. At no time. That was not the original concept behind developing a CIF CEA policy at all, and nor, I think, it's it's certainly not, not an advertisement now. So anyway, that's mm -hmm. my two cents. But thanks. And right. sorry for putting the public referendum in there. I think issues like that, if they really and truly do raise uh, uh, charter questions, I say we separate those out and deal with those those on another path, but try to move forward with what we have in front of us. Yeah, there's a lot here. So thank you. OK. So it's been shared to you. You should have that in your inboxes now. Awesome. Oh. Excellent. And I just got the other yeah. <coughs> All right. Maybe in the interest of time, um, the other things we had in the agenda was to talk about the Town Council Board of Education metrics. I think that's important to at least get your input on. So if we can do that quickly, we will. I think everything else will table until the next meeting. Um, we we're going to discuss the multi-year financial planning, which we can. Then there were a whole bunch of future items that we had on the agenda, which is um, looking at reserve accounts, we've already talked about that. Um, the impact fee fund review, recreation development fund, other all the all the fund balances things. We've already talked about that. I know Betsy, you had mentioned a software package you want us to at least demo and look at. John, we have the mill rate calculations we got to come back to and figure out 
what we're going to do. It already sounds like you have something in place, so we can. Not in place. Or, or a process in place. I started looking at uh, it. A process yeah. in place. So I guess what I like. Oh, yes. Um, so when you're thinking about these kind of single topic meetings, so with the TIF policy, I think I heard you say one of them. So as a member of the staff that I think is going to be heavily involved in your council goal of the five-year planning. Yes. Right. Um, and since it's due by September, yes. I would really welcome a um, thorough and comprehensive conversation that was very clear what you what that involves, so that that can get started. And um, but in and I say this not actually meant to be flippant, but it's going to sound it so that we don't have kind of this, like the dashboard conversation that took two and a half yes. years. I. We, if, if the finance committee could just be very clear, this is how we're interpreting that council goal. These are the elements that need yeah. to be included in that analysis so that staff can get working on that and, and have a shared set of expectations at the beginning of the process and yeah. that not that evolves over time. And, and the, re the reason I asked for the software review to try to maybe get that done early is just to get some ideas about what um, you know that five-year plan potentially could look like if we had a package involved in, in doing something like that. So it was just to open that open that door. It doesn't answer your question, which is an excellent point and an excellent question. But um, that's why I was hoping to maybe kind of get it in, you know, keep it to an hour. Um, Can you share, like, who the vendor is? And, and Yeah, I'll, and, I'll email it to you. It's, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not, like, trying to hide it. Yeah, yeah. it uh, Larissa had mentioned it before, too. She looked at it for something else. It's OpenGov. We talked about, so we actually brought that forward to the Finance Committee last year when we did it. I actually just was on the phone with them. They called to check in this year to say, hey, we demoed for you guys last year. I don't think I'm wrong about this. I know this is going to sound like an outrageous number, but I believe that when they, they cost estimated it out for us, it was an $80,000 price tag. Right. Well, they have different modules. So I guess it, it, you know, it depends. And uh, Did you see it then? You saw I did the demo? I, I, I think I Karen Martin and I demoed it with them and we agree it's amazing and it, it does all of the things that we would love to see happen but when we brought forward I believe through the budget process to the finance committee and said okay well, we've talked about a budgeting software that's outward facing and that residents would be able to kind of right. have so, be able to see what's happening and maybe even play with numbers and so forth the cost was so high right. that it felt prohibitive and that's why I wanted the group to see it and you yeah. know I mean it, it might be a funding priority it might not but you know it would go to it I mean, at least they say they have a lot of the types of planning for beautiful. the future. So I felt it might fit into that goal if it was something we ended up. So this is a little broader than the five-year plan. It, it sounds like it has some public-facing yep. components that could benefit other areas. It does. So I, I'm it usually has very skeptical of budget. leading with the software solution. I think you want to define the problem and then see if there's options for that software can help you solve. I. Uh, so I but seeing it might help. I agree. Yeah. I, I go at it both ways because sometimes it can open your mind. You know, yep. like, oh, wow, yep. we could do this, but we can't do this. You know, so. So, so I think, yeah, so I, to get to your point, yeah, I think next meeting then we should flesh out, start to work on the five-year model, what it looks like and what we're looking for. That would be like, helpful. Like just yeah. looking at the timeline of the year yep. Um, yep. and wanting to make sure that we're able to hit that deliverable of September yep. of 2020. So do that. So, what it, to get us out of here in just a little bit, hopefully, um, what you do have in front of you are two things, really. And, um, and, and sorry for, I, it, and, and so the first was a draft resolution that was kind of the work of the chair, Don, at the time, and Sarah at the time. And there's a lot of words, but I think what we're just trying to get, and, and the purpose here is just to get the two bodies aligned on sort of what the expectation is for the delivered budgets at the first and second read. And I think where we got to, to the, the important parts are really the first reading and the second reading, these bullets that are here, and you guys can read them, at the first reading date, to be determined, have to determine the dates, the town manager will present a net town budget not to exceed 3%. Net budgeting is defined as a goal to deliver programs and services and accounting for all revenues and subsidies received between fiscal year 16 and 20. Net budget increases of average 2.43%, and you see the range. Similarly, um, so that's at the first reading, and, and the second piece is really a similar piece in there around the schools and what they are expected to deliver at the first read. 
and what we're, the thought process was historically when those numbers are delivered at the first read, it usually produces about a 3% increase. It's not, it's not, it's, it's only the starting point for conversation. We will then go through the normal process. But we didn't formally adopt it as the town council. We talked about it, and I think, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we kind of made a passing reference to it. We, you know, we approved it as a finance committee to go forward to the council, yeah. but it was never formally read in detail or you know, any action uh, by the town council. And then the second document that was passed out that Tom has summarized is what the Board of Education has shared um, with their team. So I, I think we're in alignment. I just want this group to be aware, see if you're okay with it, and if you're comfortable bringing it forward to a conversation with the council. Sure. So I, I guess... Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. If I, start? Yeah. Uh, I when you use historical data to try to predict what's going to happen yeah. in the future, you need to understand what's going to be different in the future from the data that you're using. Yeah. Yeah. And just intuitively, it, it doesn't make sense that the schools get to go up 6% and the town gets to go up 3% because we're <laughs> largely driven by staff costs and benefits. And uh, I don't, and I want to pay everybody more, but I don't have a logical reason to explain that, which makes me think, there's something in the historical data, like maybe uh, you know, reducing funding from the state is one of the things, and maybe some other anomalies that are driving the average that's not going to carry forward into next year. So what I would want to understand, I guess, is, and they're listed as maximums, so that's okay, but what do we expect? It, let's say we do this next year, the town goes up 3%, schools go up 6%. What do you expect that first read mill rate to be? And I, I think we're going to be surprised at the answer. I don't think it's going to follow what has historically happened. Uh, and I think you're setting us up for a situation where we come in at first read with an 8% mill rate increase. And we've got to get to 3% by second. And I know Tom wouldn't do this. He wouldn't come in that high. He would beat these numbers. But you know, we've got to knock five points off of our mill rate as a council. And I think that's uh, too much to ask for a council. So I guess that's, I don't necessarily support going forward with this unless we were to translate that first read goal into a mill rate, you know, you can start with this, but then go to well, I think a mill rate not to exceed 5% or 4%. Well, I increase. think that's the second part of this is that, you know, the second, what, so the, so the, so the goal of trying to do this and some of the history was what you just described has been the tensions for a while, that, that conversation. When we've tried to do this on the first read in the past, you know, sort of <coughs> some of the mentality was we're going to deliver the budget that we think it's our responsibility to say this is what we need, irregardless of how that falls out. So there were some numbers that you're right, we're delivering at first read close to double digit mill rate increase as best we could estimate. And that set off a whole cascade <coughs> of events where um, you know, the public would hear that right. and run with it. But usually what happens is the first read is when the media is here and they'll put on the front page the next day, yeah. Scarborough tax rate going up 10%. And you start this, you start behind the eight ball. What we're trying to do is say, gee, we, and, and, it's, and it's been an ongoing conversation between the two bodies. How do we integrate? We used to work pretty independently. We're trying to come together. This was, and, and Don, maybe you can help me. This was a challenging compromise, if you will, or, or point. Our, it's not a perfect science. Our goal is if at least we start here, we can start the conversation saying, okay, this is our starting point. We still need to get to an overall 3% mill rate, but we're, instead of getting into, you know, that, <coughs> that starting behind the eight ball, we at least start on target to some degree, and then we can roll up our sleeves and say, how do we get there? That's, that's the intent. I, it's, not, it's not perfect, and you'll have a great opportunity we, in, in the ongoing conversations yeah. on how do we refine this, but in the past, we haven't had targets. This at least contains a target that we can all agree that if we start there, then we work collaboratively to get to where we need to get to. That's, that was the intent. 
Don, is that does that is that how would you yeah. how would you describe that? Yeah, I, I think that's an accurate uh, account. Uh, the only thing I'd add is that we, we went back and forth on the numbers, even putting historical numbers in there. And I remember getting some preliminary feedback from from others who hadn't yeah. hadn't been sworn in yet. Uh, you know, we just felt we wanted to get this in front of you formally as a finance committee uh, before we went through any town council uh, you know, formal review or action. Um, so. Th I was at one point, I didn't want to share any numbers. I just said we wanted to set, try to set numbers, though, for first and second reading. And then we used historicals to try to say what had been in the past. And there's all kinds of disclaimer language in this joint resolution to say, we're going to take into account uh, you know, all the factors that John raised, the fact you know, that, that we're going to have a new set of issues we're dealing with this year. We, we've seen some of them this evening. And then that would guide the overall target, the formal target setting as part of your budget process. So uh, it was really more process, I think, guidance than quantitative target guidance. I think you just answered my question. So this would be a joint resolution. You know, it's not a policy yet. We might do it again next year and next year. So we really, truly, I don't want to call it a work in progress, but it would be something and you know we don't have much say over the uh, how the school budget, how the schools do their budget. You know I, you know it would be interesting to me for them to break out some things that are extra and new programs and things like that. And so this would not preclude them from doing that kind of in a separate bucket, right? So I mean I, I think um, you know that's what a lot of and that, that may be how you do it. As a matter of fact, I think I recall it. So. You know, there's, you know, these are new programs that we're really thinking could be a good idea to fund. And I, I do think they call that out, so I'm not saying that they don't. But we would kind of put that, if, if they didn't hit their 6%, if they agreed to it, they would kind of put that in a separate bucket. It doesn't mean they couldn't talk about it, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we were trying to set up sort of a model because they really did have some of that last year. Where what, what, they, what we have committed to on both sides, <coughs> there's an opportunity when these numbers are delivered then to talk to us about the things, the needs that may not, that are not going to be met, and what would it take to, to meet those needs? And, and you know, I know, just from the municipal side, Tom does that every year. And, and there have been times when the departments have come from in front of us and made made their case, and we've made those adjustments. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that the what the school, the board of education, I think in the past, all of that stuff used to be built in. And it was difficult to find. What they started to pivot to last year was the very same thing. They kind of had prioritized things that they mm -hmm. thought they needed to do, and they had some numbers there, and they kind of had a, a list of these are maybe the things that aren't going to happen, and, and what do you do? Um, so this really is trying to turn the page a little bit. It's not perfect, but it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And I and I can share with you, and Tom, you, you've been at the table for many years. It's mm -hmm. This is a little bit of a difference from what it's been. I mean, what's sort of your perspective on? Uh, I've been certainly part of this and, and generally agreeable. I think the one difference is um, what we know uh, with our valuation for next year. Yeah, no, it's going to be you know, a If we do hit those initial first reading targets, um, what I know about the valuation, we're not going to get to 3%. We're going to have to be lower than those targets, and so I think what I'm hearing Councilor Kluge <coughs> say is, you set a policy and expectation, we may be setting ourselves up for failure given the circumstances that we know uh, today. But generally speaking, um, you know, we've been landing very comfortably in these ranges and being able to advance both town and, and school affairs at the same time. So, all things being equal, I was comfortable with this. I think we've got a just kind of a new phenomenon. That's probably a one-year thing for us, yeah. and then we're going to go back to some level of normalcy. Hmm. And can I speak to a question? I think I heard Councillor Kuchi say about the difference between the three percent and the six percent for the town yeah. and school, and feeling a little bit uncomfortable with that. I think it's important that the word net not be lost here. I think that part of that difference is because the town has the ability to raise revenue in a way that yeah. the school mm -hmm. does not, and so that accounts for some okay. of that difference. Not all of it, but it accounts for some right. of it. Thank you. That does help. But but. Equally important, I think, John, you mentioned it, um, many of the years studied in part of these, this, 
uh, this analysis were years where there was, you know, free fall, million dollar loss year over year <coughs> in revenues. And so their net budget numbers were arguably artificially high. We're now leveled out at minimal receivership. Well, didn't we, take, we took the Wentworth funds, I think $4 million yeah. one year, yeah, and so, applied it to debt over so two your, years. So your point's well taken. Those yeah. numbers on the school side might be a little inflated because of yep. some of those phenomena. My suggestion would be, Tom, on your piece now that we know the valuation piece, that is a great conversation for the next Joint Finance Committee. Sure. To say, since we had this conversation, here is the reality that we're going to be facing as a community. And and, and we've got to shoulder it together. Um, it's, you know, even it's, if it's exactly the town right. cannot take absorb all of that. No, no. And that's, so I think that I think the way to weave that into the conversation, and, and you know, I know we're trying to have that meeting soon, so before the budgets are delivered, Mm -hmm. Those are conversations that need to be on the table. I'll have that conversation with Sandy, with the superintendent, to make sure he's aware. Well, you know, I have a ton of ideas. I'm sure you do. But I really like where this is in terms of, you know, who knows if the exact percentages are what we'd want. But just the idea of it, I think, is a really good idea to take forward. Um, and, you know, continuing those joint uh, meetings, I mean, that was I don't know. Had, had you ever had those before? I mean, sure. It, yeah. In the last three or four years. Yeah. So common. I think those are for the last three or four years. That's not like the whole tenure. I just no. think it's, I think they're great. I mean, I think, and if this is goes in support of this, then I'm sure there's kinks that could be worked out. And you you mentioned some to me. I won't say them because you're not saying them out loud. But I thought you had some really good points about how you drive that that their number based on some other <laughs> factors besides historical. Um, so. You know. Oh, about alternate. Yeah, there's a thousand ways you can do this, and I right. Yeah, I support absolutely. the concept. Yeah, right. Having clear guidance at first read, second read is right. Yeah, it's helpful. Where my hesitation is is introducing this this year. Um, I don't think gives direction. I think it blurries the lines. I like I'd be comfortable first read show up with a four and a half five percent uh, yep. mill rate increase, and together you figure out how uh, <coughs> where it comes from, whether it's school or any other department. I'm I'm not exactly clear why we differentiate the guidance, I guess, for, the, okay. to me, I yeah. think Tom can kind of do that mm -hmm. with his role. Um, is the intention for action to happen here and then for the council to affirm or, or approve? I, you know, I, I think where we ended up and test that with is at some point, though, I think, I thought, Tom, you had suggested that it be a non-action item just kind of report out it's a recommendation from yeah, the finance I, committee. I don't think that was a suggestion. That was my understanding of how the school board's chosen to deal with yeah. it. Um, yeah. I, I wondered whether the council would adopt something like this in its goal setting. It adopted a portion of it, but not all of it. Um, I think it could be done as a report out, as a, as a committee report, frankly. Yeah. Um, I think it's really for internal... Uh, expectations first and foremost to make sure the Board of Education and the school administrative staff and myself and the town council all, all are walking into this budget process with kind of a mutual expectation right I mean I, I think what we're trying to the last even though the joint finance committees have been meeting I mean I think they've been each year we are prior to last year or even last year we we'd kind of arrive with different expectations on the first read, which, which started the whole process off <coughs> on, on a sort of a negative note instead right. of a positive note. I think all we were trying to achieve with this, this is going to be a step process, is we at least start off that first read as saying, okay, this is, this is what we talked about. It may not, it's not the final answer. Now we got to figure out how we get there. Right. Um, so I will, I will, for this group, or what I will do is confirm, I think, Sarah, I'll find out how it was presented to the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. I think if they voted it in and they're committed to it, I, th I would recommend that we do the same because it really was, at that point in time, it was developed, was mm -hmm. developed in good faith between the two parties. Mm -hmm. If they did it as a non-action item, then I think a readout would be fine and say that's our intent. Fair enough. If they took some type of action on it, I will poll this group and decide what we want to do with that and okay. have a placeholder on the agenda for the next town council meeting. On the 5th? As soon as next week, Peter? If you, yeah. <coughs> if, if, if 
everybody's like, are you guys okay? So I guess I'm trying to understand the, so we're not voting to move this or to recommend that the council adopt this. What you're saying is you'll take it, you wrote for it that we talked about it, and that's it. It's, I guess I'm not clear on I, what. I'd be comfortable voting that we recommend it to the council. I, I mean, I'd be comfortable voting for that, but that's, that's me. Not, and then you deciding how it goes forward, but I'm, I'm comfortable okay. like having a vote on it. Do we, would we recommend this to go to the council? I would not, uh, just because I, I don't think it's going to be very useful for this year. I think it'll cause more fighting. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, um, if so, it's possible, so, if that's possible, but so but I can. You know, if you guys want to move to move it forward, that's fine. And I guess I would vote to take. I would vote to take it to the town council if, in fact, the board of education has already voted it in their board. Um, and I will confirm that. If they haven't done it, then, then I'm comfortable doing it as a non-action item and report out, which sounds like it's your comfort mm -hmm. zone. Yeah, or, or spend some time coming up with a goal that might help us this year. With all due respect, um, you know, this was months in process, and Peter can attest to it. And so I, your points are extremely well taken, and I hope you raise them to make sure everyone appreciates that this is not perfect. In fact, there's some yeah. mm -hmm. obvious flaws, but I think it uh, would be unfortunate to cast aside the, the work, the good work that was done last fall. So, uh, I mean, to, to that end, I, I guess I wouldn't endorse this. I'm okay having it, you know, being brought before the council and discussed, okay. and, uh, you know, I have no problem with that. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let me let me loop it and I'll look back to both of you. Yeah, and just to follow up on that really quickly, I mean, I think based on a few conversations we had, you have some really good ideas. My only hesitation with that is that we're running out of time, and I, I get so you you would you'd kind of say I'd, I'd rather not adopt it because we're running out of time, and I I'm kind of saying I'd rather adopt it because we're running out of time, which isn't always my default position. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know, so, but on this particular case. It, this is my, you know, default position that it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good thing to start from. But many points well taken. So, sure. All right. So with that, um, item five in the agenda was just the next meeting is February twenty sixth. Although we will schedule a meeting for the TIF policy review, and we've already gone over the other items. The last item is public comment, and seeing there's. And I guess not, I don't even know if you're in the public. <laughs> so with that, um, I guess I have a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor. Thank you, guys. Sorry it went over. Oh, thank you.